Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our, uh, hopefully here soon, our uh, city council meeting, but we're going to start with the Municipal Housing Agency Governing Board meeting, uh, and it's 446, so I'm going to ask the, uh, the clerk to please take roll of our uh, board members, please. Hello. Is it, we can't hear you, Kay. You're not on. County? Here. Bozen? Here. Boss? Here. Shoemaker? Westergaard? Here. Mandelbaum? Here. And I'm trying to call Joe back. We had to restart the computer, so he's not here either then. So we have a quorum. Okie doke. Uh, item two is approving the agenda as presented and or as amended. I'll move item two. Item two has been moved. So. A second. We've got a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any negative votes? Seeing none, we'll move forward. Item three is a hearing and adoption of the amended Municipal Housing Agency annual budget for the fiscal year ending June 30 of 2022, board communication number 22-126. I've asked the city manager to quickly uh, make comment on this. Mr. Manager. Yes, thank you, Mayor and Council members, members of the public. Uh, for clarification, the city council sits as the housing uh, agency board and approves the budget each year in this action that we have in front of us. The uh, budget then is uh, continue, or excuse me, included within the city's entire budget. Uh, that we have on the agenda with the council later. There may have been some confusion because the numbers for the entire budget were shared in the same letter, in the same communication that's been labeled 22 126. If there's uh, questions or interest in just the housing portion of the city's budget, you'll find that on page four of that letter. And just to give you an idea of magnitude, that's a $24 million budget annually and again that details in that that letter along with all the other pieces so it's a two-step process uh, the city council sits as the board first to approve it here and then it gets included in the total budget uh, that's later tonight in the council agenda i can take any questions mayor from the council if there's another question i move item um item three. three three yes i'll second it Moved and seconded. Uh, would you pull the public? Okay. I'll vote yes, Your Honor. All right. Um, we have a move and a second, and I'll ask uh, the public if there's anyone that would like to make a comment regarding the Municipal Housing Agency uh, budget. Seeing none, we have a motion and a second, and uh, one vote. If everybody else will register. My button's mixed up. I believe we have six yes. Your Honor, that's six I yes motion. Yeah. Oh, you got to get Joe. Yep. Okay. I voted yes. All right, thank yeah, you. No. Thanks, Joe. Item four is a hearing and adoption of the proposed municipal housing agency annual budget for fiscal year ending June 30 of 2023, board communication number 22-126. Okay, good as well. Okay, good. Mayor? Yep. It's all right, uh, just again for clarification, um, this is the item that approves next year's budget. The first item that was uh, sp spoken and voted on was for an amendment of the current year. So this item number four here is for next year's budget. Current year ending June 30 of 22. Uh, 23. No, the, fir the, the first, first one was. was. This one is of 23. Yep. So um, open it up. Is there anyone in the public would like to make comment about the Municipal Housing Agency budget for 2023? Seeing none, could we get a motion? I'll move item four. Item four has been moved and it's been seconded. Joe? I'll vote yes, Your Honor. All right. 
Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Okie doke. Item five is approval of the certification of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development by the amended operating budget for all projects for fiscal year ending June 30 of 2022 and of the proposed operating budget for all projects for fiscal year ending June 30, 2023. Could we get a motion on that one? I'll move item five. Second. Item five has been moved and seconded. I'll ask everybody to vote. I'll vote yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Takes us to item six. It's the City of Des Moines Municipal Housing Agency submittal of the radon testing and mitigation demonstration for public housing grant application to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. Board communication 22-135. If we could get a motion on that one. I'll move item six. Second. Item six has been moved and Carl seconded. I'll ask everyone to vote. Joe? I'll vote yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. All right. Uh, could I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Passes. Uh, Municipal Housing Agency sits adjourned. Thank you. Is Aaron McLaren in? Aaron? Aha. Would you come up? can't do it. Oh, come on. Boom. We got it. All right. Everybody, this is really an exciting uh, piece. We uh, have worked with the Healthy State uh, Initiative, and I'm going to have Aaron kind of come up and explain it a little bit. But we had an opportunity uh, with the U.S. Conference of Mayors to make application. And this is about healthy foods and feeding uh, and getting healthy foods to people that, that really need it. But Erin, I'm going to let you explain it. Oh, we're very excited to partner with the City of Des Moines on a produce prescription program. We were awarded a U.S. Mayor's Grant for medium-sized cities, and we won first place. Um, with those funds, we are going to implement fruit and vegetable produce prescriptions. So physicians like Dr. Danley at Broadlawns will be able to prescribe her patients and their families uh, prescriptions for fresh fruits and vegetables. They can take those and they'll spend them like cash at Iowa-owned grocery stores and Iowa farmers markets. So um, working to make Iowa the healthiest state in the nation and starting with the city of Des Moines and our citizens right here. So we're very excited and we appreciate your support, Mayor County. Absolutely, and for that, we received our first place award of $175,000 to oh help people. Uh -huh. Thank you.
Frank? Yeah. Will I be able to say a few words at the beginning of the meeting? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Just whenever. Also, um, I'd like to um, acknowledge, but quite frankly, um, say that we as a council, our hearts go out to the students at East High School and to the parents and to all those in this city. Uh, our ward council person, Linda Westergaard, uh, wants to make a quick statement and I'm going to turn it over to her right now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Two weeks ago, we were all shaken when a drive-by shooting killed a 15-year-old and wounded two East High students. Six teenagers were arrested and charged. In an instant, many lives were changed forever. Tonight, I want to acknowledge and thank the police department and the fire department for their professionalism and fast work. Both departments immediately responded within minutes. The first responders did exactly what they are trained to do, and they did a superb job. The police department went to work, and with one hour, they had six suspects detained, and that's six guns that are off our streets. Our fire department is credited with saving the lives of the two young women. The doctors and nurses were able to then treat the victims, and their expertise is why they are alive today. The staff at East High is to be commended for their quick action under the most extreme circumstances. Over the next week, several groups met to talk about the tragic event. I met with parents whose kids will forever be impacted. We must all work together to stop the violence in our city, and this means every resident, our faith-based organizations, and other nonprofits must work together. The time for talk is over, and now we need every, step, every stakeholder to step forward. I'm proud of what our city is doing. We will be implementing our 2022 Social Equity Recreation Program for Youth that will be expanded into four neighborhood parks. Our Parks and Recreation Department also offers a scholarship program for youth activities as we don't want anyone to be left out. I printed this, this is on the website, our city website, if you wanna take a look at what we're doing in parks to bring activities to kids in our community. The, uh, we also have a scholarship program, so for $5, and if you can't afford $5, we'll find a way to make it work. But we have programming 325 days a year in this city for youth. I very, uh, talked to Ben Page from, from Park and Rec, and that's 325 days we can work to get these kids off the streets. So we, now's the time. We need everybody to step forward and, and get these kids active and busy with things. Gun, youth gun violence is a growing and alarming phenomenon in this country, and Des Moines is not immune to the problem. As a council, we must continue to seek solutions and work more urgently with our community leaders who have fought this struggle for far too long. With that, if we could just take a couple of minutes of silence, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. With that, it's five o'clock, let's call this meeting to order and I'll ask the clerk to please take roll. County? Here. Bozen? Here. Boss? Here. Shoemaker? Here. Westergaard? Yes. Mandelbaum? Here. Gatto? Here. Your Honor, we have a quorum. Item two is approving the agenda as presented and or as amended. I'll move so, approval of the agenda. Second. All right. <laughs> and I will say uh, quickly on the, uh, <coughs> the amendments, uh, item 21I was added as a recommendation from Council Member Westergaard to reappoint William C. Page to the Planning and Zoning Commission. 39 was added, Downtown Farmers Market banners request. And 52B was withdrawn. It's an item moved to the next agenda for consideration. And um, item 61 is a roll call, which is on the regular agenda items. So with that, 
I will ask everybody to, um, I guess we can voice just vote. say a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Item passes. Item three is approving the uh, consent agenda. Item three uh, this evening are items three through 58. Uh, these are routine items that uh, will be enacted by one roll call vote without separate discussion. Uh, I will add that item seven, council member Voss wishes to speak. And item 15, council member uh, Westergaard uh, wishes to speak and votes no. I'd like to pull 54 as well. Pull 54? Yep. If that's all, Mayor, I will uh, move to approve the consent agenda do. as amended. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. I'd ask everybody to vote at this time. Vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. All right. So let's quickly move to item 59. Item 59 is um, a hearing item. Uh, this evening I'll kind of go through our rules as quickly as I can. For the hearing items, we have three zoning items this evening. Those are 61 and 63. We also have one vacation uh, hearing uh, and one conveyance hearing. Hearings on the CIP budget and budget amendments and a new budget and item to dismiss hearings for which there will be no public comment and several public improvement hearings. As a reminder for the zoning items only, which are the 61, 2, and 3, we will hear from the parties in interest first and then from the general public. Uh, the parties in interest uh, in the zoning, again, are included only the applicant and those persons living within the 250 feet of the property to be rezoned to whom the city has sent notices. After all the parties in interest have commented, uh, we will open it up to any um, member of the public for germane comments and to add in reorganizing uh, the parties in interest to zoning item to speak. I will ask everyone not to step to the microphone unless you are either the applicant or live within that 250 feet uh, of the, the zoning. Anyone who approaches the mic uh, before their time uh, will be considered disruptive and will not be recognized for the remainder of the meeting and will be required to leave the building. So please, until I call on general public for zoning items or you will not be called on for the remainder of the evening and again required to leave the building. After all, the parties in interest have been called upon the general public comment and not to exceed one minute per person to a maximum of seven minutes will be called upon for germane public comments unless the hearing is ended sooner for failure to make those germane comments or there are no comments. For the CIP uh, budget amendment hearing and new budget hearings, the general public comment at not to exceed one minute per person will be called upon for germane comments until the comments become repetitive or germane or they cease. And for all other hearings this evening, any interested person may make germane comments at not to exceed one minute per person for a maximum of five minutes on those other hearings, unless the hearing is ended sooner for failure to make germane comments uh, or when those comments cease. As a reminder, on the public improvement hearings, only comments as to the plans, the specifications, form of documents, and engineer's estimate, and the low bidder designation will be considered germane all other comments will be considered non-germane. And uh, for the item dismissing bids, uh, no public comment will be had at this meeting. Uh, I think that is enough. Let's get started. <laughs> item 59 is on a conveyance of an excess city property located known as 31 East Creston Avenue to Daniel Garcia for $500. Uh, we'll open it up and ask for any germane comments from the general public. Um, one minute per person, up to five. <laughs> 
Anybody to speak on this item? Seeing none, could we have a motion? I'll move approval. I'll move item 59. Second. Item 59 has been moved and seconded. I'll ask everyone to vote. Joe? I vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 60 is on the vacation of a portion of East County Line Road located north of and adjoining 2351 East County Line Road and approval of land exchange agreement with Iowa Power and Light Company, uh, NKA as Mid-American Energy Company. Uh, A is the first consideration of the ordinance above. Anyone to speak? Uh, with Jermaine comments on this item. Seeing none, could we have a motion? I'll move item 60, 60A, and pursuant to rule 42, waive the second and third reading. Second. All right, been moved and seconded. I'll ask everyone to vote. I vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Okay. Item 61 is on a request from Mark Lyle and Karen Lyle to amend Plan DSM, creating our tomorrow future land use designation for property located at 1100 Army Post Road from community mixed use to industrial to allow the rezoning from RX1 mixed use district to I2 industrial use to allow for outdoor storage. Choose alternative A to deny the proposed amendment to the plan DSM creating our tomorrow comprehensive future land use plan designation and rezoning or choose alternative B to approve the proposed rezoning from RX1 mixed use district to I1 industrial district subject to conditions acceptable to the city and the owners requires six out of seven votes to pass. Let's go ahead and open it up and see if there is anyone parties in interest first. To speak any party in interest. Let's now ask, is there anyone within 250 feet of this property to be rezoned that would like to speak on this item? All right, seeing none, um, we'll open up the general public and see if there's any germane comments from the general public regarding this item. Anyone? Seeing none, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, I'm. Happy to move item 61A. I'm a little confused as to why we want to deny this. Just generally that the surrounding neighbors in um, all of the planning and zoning documents were supportive of the rezoning. Um, and I, I guess it just looked like it was unlikely that um, if we were to deny the rezoning that they would get the um, adjustment to continue what they've been doing there and it, ha it looked like it hadn't been an issue for any of the neighbors. So the staff recommendation and the Planning and Zoning Commission both recommended denial of the rezoning. Mm -hmm. This would make this rezoned as industrial which is on a corridor. Uh, rezoning runs with the land uh, and outdoor storage on and on a corridor I think is a very limiting limiting approach. So I'm not in favor of changing the zoning in such a way. There are not other industrially zoned areas in that corridor. Uh, and I just don't think that that's the appropriate use for what we want our corridors to be, even if folks are not objecting. And we would limit our ability uh, to alter this if he sold it to someone who, for example, did not uh, did not have as minimal an outdoor storage as mm -hmm. the current occupant does. We would also perhaps limit our ability if that occupant uh, started uh, or changed the way that they were conducting outdoor storage. So 
from a corridor perspective, I'm not supportive of, of changing this to an industrial use when the surrounding uses are, are mixed use. And I do agree with all that. Um, I guess it was just the, um, that the, we would be able to, it would be subject to conditions acceptable to the city and the owners, that we can put those limitations on the lot that would follow the land um, moving forward. It, it's just a question of like, would an adjustment be possible after we did deny the rezoning? And it seemed like it was unlikely that, that would happen. And we would just end up like preventing the current use of the lot was my concern. It, again, I, I think this is the more appropriate way to address this. And uh, I'm comfortable with, with the motion on, on this item. I'll second it. Mr. Mayor, yeah, I, can I just jump in real quick? I'm very familiar with the area and when that, when that was purchased and they had came in front of us, I believe. Um, I, I would I would agree with Josh 100% that this, this is not the appropriate use. They knew what they were going to use it for, and I think we asked some of the questions when they when they went into this building and where they were going to store some of the things. So uh, it, it's it's not an appropriate use of what they want to do. So I, I, I appreciate the, the ward councilman stepping up and, and taking this, and I would I would support him 100%. I appreciate the discussion. All right, ask everybody to vote. It's been moved and seconded. Joe? I vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes, motion carried. All right, item 62 is on a request from Oaks on Fleur, LLC, to amend Plan DSM, creating our tomorrow future land use designation for property located at 3010 Fleur Drive and 3020 Fleur Drive from low density residential to medium density residential to rezone from N3A neighborhood district to limited NX1 neighborhood district to allow development of approximately 14 row homes dwelling units. You're asked to choose either alternative A, which is to deny the proposed amendment to the plan DSM, creating our tomorrow comprehend to uh, future land use plan designation and rezoning, or choose alternative B to approve the proposed plan DSM, creating our tomorrow land use plan amendment from low density residential to medium density residential and approve the proposed rezoning from N3A neighborhood district to a limited NX1 neighborhood district subject to conditions acceptable by the city and the owners requires six sevenths uh, vote to pass. Uh, I'll ask first if there's parties in interest uh, in the property um, and uh, the applicant first if he would like to speak or make any comments uh, this evening. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this one's on. I th that one is for sure. Adam, we do have your, is that Adam? I have that presentation and we can present it. Okay, do you want him at the uh, the lectern or at the microphone? Just as long as he gives us directions to when to go to the next slide. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, this one. Slide it up. Try, try yeah. tapping it. Try tapping it. Hello. Yeah, there you go. You're set. I guess I'll talk. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Adam Searin, and I'm the owner of uh, the Oaks on Fleur, uh, 15 unit or 14, 14 to 15 unit townhome development. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of your, all of you, Mr. Mayor and Councilors, for your time in this matter um, and your transparency of, of being available um, via text and phone and email, and, and I really appreciate that working with the City of Des Moines. Um, we're going from in 3 b neighborhood zoning, which is house type B, to an NX1 um, type zoning. Um, little history about me, grew up on the south side, moved out west for many years, and recently purchased the home in the southwestern hills neighborhood. And so I'm a member of George Davis's wonderful neighborhood association. Um, I live about three blocks from this current site right now. Um, the, I'm kind of, the city of Des Moines has come out with the new tax abatement schedule, and uh, I kind of wanted to go back 
and look at other municipalities and cities and kind of see what they're doing for townhomes, and that's what this slide shows. Uh, West Des Moines issued 161 townhome permits. Waukee was 157. Ankeny, 256 townhomes. And Des Moines uh, issued 56 townhome permits uh, fiscal year um, 2021. Um, next slide. And so this kind of shows the need for this uh, type of housing, and I think why the city of Des Moines has incentivized this. There's a downtown workforce housing study I'm sure we're all familiar with. Des Moines is expected to be 57,000 housing units short over the next 20 years. This is 2,850 housing units per year. Um, 248 permits were issued in 2021, so we're, we're less than 10% shy of that projected number. Um, although this particular housing is not considered workforce housing, 12% of this number is for housing units over 350,000. This equals 6,800 homes per year needed in this price range, or 340 units per year. And I expect this is why the city of Des Moines has incentivized this type of medium density row home construction with the nine-year tax abatement. Um, this talks a little bit about the plan. I'm sure we, you all passed this. Um, nine-year tax abatement put in effect on February 1st. This medium density row home housing has been recognized by the city leaders as an important part of the long-term housing goals for the city of Des Moines. And denying this zoning amendment would send a message to other developers. It would be detrimental to pr promoting this type of infill housing in Des Moines. Uh, part of this was a term called missing middle housing, a uh, book by Daniel Paralek. Um, the term missing middle has two meanings. I think it's very misunderstood in many ways. Um, first and most importantly, it represents the middle scale of buildings between single family homes and large apartments or condo buildings. Secondly, the definition of middle relates to the affordability or attainability level. These types of historically delivered attainable housing choices to the middle income families without subsidies and continue to play a role in providing homes to the middle income market segment. Uh, that being said, it is important to note, missing middle housing is not exclusively targeted a middle income market. There's a large pent up demand for these housing types at the upper end of the market, as well as from downsizing baby boomers, single person households, and millennials who want walkable living. That was quoted directly um, from the book. So, you know, a lot of people have been this missing middle is, has been kind of controversial in ways with, with what it's the meaning of it. And you know, I think the city has adopted this term, um, but it doesn't always mean it's necessarily affordable. It just means it's, it, it, affordability is a piece of it, and I think that's definitely important, um, but it also means the, the middle style of building between transitioning between corridors. Um, Des Moines Clean Energy in Initiative. So this talks about row home construction and the um, all electric, uh, energy efficiency. Um, thanks to the efforts of our mayor and council member Mandelbaum, Des Moines is a national leader in clean energy. To reach the goal to become 24-7 carbon-free electric by 2035, Des Moines needs this type of all-electric shared wall housing. This is why the city has decided to incentivize row, ho row home construction with a nine-year tax abatement. The proximity to the DART bus stop, walkability with new sidewalks connecting to the bike trail, electrical vehicle charging stations, all these contributing factors align with Des Moines' clean energy goals. Uh, market demand and economic impact. Southwestern Hills is, is one of a prominent neighborhood in Des Moines. Um, it's an aging population, and I believe there's a demand for this type of housing in Southwestern Hills. I've spoken to residents. Um, little short story the, on the corner of Park Fleur, Mr. and Mrs. Ross. They were looking, they've, been in, they've lived in the Park Fleur, they've raised their family on Southern Hills Drive, they live on the corner of Park Fleur, and it just broke my heart to listen to them talk about looking at townhomes in King's Landing in West Des Moines. And she's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my vet, I don't know where I'm going to go, you know. And I was just, I couldn't believe that she was going to leave a community that she's been at for 45 years, and all of her kids have grown up, and I just, we don't have this type of housing for this western corridor of Des Moines. It's just not there. Um, and I believe there is a demand for this type of housing, townhome housing, for the Southwestern Hills residents. It's keeping the residents here. It's keeping them from, it's, it's the suburban sprawl is, is what we're trying to eliminate. So, I did get the neighborhood, sir. Sorry, I thought I had 10 minutes. But. 
Did they want more? You may have questions regarding that stormwater and the light pollution, the tree mitigation. So um, if you'll remain around, we'll, okay. we may have to call you back. Okay, sure. Thank you for your time. Let's uh, now ask, is, are there any other um, individuals who are within 250 feet of this development who would like to make comment at this time? Come forward. My name is Tony Gardner, 2118 Willamere Drive, Ward 3. According to the Iowa Supreme Court, spot zoning is defined as when a rezoning decision of a single parcel or small island of property with restrictions on its use different from those imposed on the surrounding property. However, zoning is not appropriate if it is for the financial benefit of an individual property owner but detrimental to the surrounding area. Spot zoning for the sole benefit of the landowner and contrary to the comprehensive plan is unreasonable. To be upheld as legal spot zoning, there must be a substantial and reasonable grounds or basis for the discrimination when one lot or tract is singled out by an amendatory ordinance, removing restrictions that are imposed upon the remaining portions of the same zoning district. In determining the validity of spot zoning, the Iowa Supreme Court applies a three-pronged test, and that considers whether the new zoning is germane to an object within the police power, whether there is a reasonable basis for making a distinction between the spot zone land and the surrounding property, and whether the rezoning is consistent with the comprehensive plan. It is clear the proposed rezoning does not meet the requirements of the Iowa Supreme Court to be deemed legal. This determination, along with the recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Commission and the hundreds of petition signatures from nearby residents opposed to this development is more than enough reason to object this rezoning. I've read the Plan DSM and I understand the desire to increase density on main corridors. However, nowhere does it say that homes will be destroyed to meet this objective. By voting to approve this item, you are undermining the Iowa Supreme Court, you're belittling the Planning and Zoning Commission and dismissing the valid concerns of the hundreds of citizens. Now, I will tell you that um, I'm sure Southwestern Hills board members are going to come up here and speak, and I assure you they do not speak on the behalf of the residents. In fact, two weeks ago, we had an association meeting, Mr. Councilman Mandelbaum and Mr. Mayor, you attended. And if I could quote the president of the board when he says, just to be clear, I don't see anywhere in the plans where a home would be removed. Now, to accept a recommendation from the association board when the president of that board doesn't fully understand the scope of the project would be egregious. And if I could leave you just with one quote. Adam said it just a second ago talking about Mrs. Ross. He said, Mrs. Ross does not want to look at townhomes. Thank you. Do we have another speaker? Party in interest, yes. Paula Noonan, uh, third ward resident. I live on Fleur Drive across the street from the proposed uh, rezoning area. And I'm here in opposition of it. I would allow, it would allow stack and pack higher density housing on a lot that was a single family home. It's currently zoned N3A, protected in plan DSM by chapter 133, which, 134, which embraces and protects character of historical neighborhoods like ours established over 55 years. P&Z recommended to protect our neighborhood in a nine to five vote against spot rezoning in the interest of neighbors because it would affect the overall general appearance of the neighborhood and our values. 
300 neighbors in the third ward have signed a petition opposing the rezoning. That's all in the 50321 area code, the 503, oh, sorry, zip code, and the 50315 zip code. And within the 200 foot proximity, most of those houses um, are on our petition list as, op as opposing. Uh, PNZ also noted in a recorded meeting that Southwestern Hills Neighborhood Association had not represented the true opinion of the opposition to this project. So that is recorded out on YouTube for anybody to go out and hear. We are not against development. We are against spot rezoning of this particular lot on Fleur that is less than an acre of land. Just respotting this one zone for this project seems inconceivable. I and many neighbors have lived in this neighborhood almost 40 years. We do not want to be pushed out by someone's vision that can only be accomplished by rezoning of a certain spot less than an acre. Higher residential and retail density zones already exist further down along the Fleur Corridor, north of this proposed area at Grays Lake and Bell Avenue. And our small pocket zone of Fleur should stay protected by the N3A zone, which we are in. What benefit does Des Moines receive from rezoning this small spot of land? Fleur Drive is our gateway, greeting dignitaries and presidents. Do we want ourselves represented at first glance to those visitors as an overrun buildup of stack and pack housing or a beautiful established section of Fleur homes that greet people to Des Moines? Our neighborhoods and quality of life is what attracts people here, not higher density stack and pack housing. We implore City Councilman Mandelbaum, who we elected to represent the true voice of Ward 3, to represent that voice and to protect our community from the spot zoning and to destroy and the destruction of our neighborhood. We ask City Council to protect us and vote against spot rezoning of Fleur Drive. Hear the voices that have been raised from the community, listen to them, protect us from driven, being driven out of our homes in our neighborhood in the name of development. Are there any other parties in interest? I'm just outside the 250, so can I speak or I still need to wait? If you're outside, we're going to ask you to wait. Okay. Yes, step forward. Jessica Gardner, 2118 Willamere Drive, Ward 3. She, her pronouns. I've been a resident of the neighborhood for 16 years. In that time, I've witnessed at least a dozen vehicle accidents along Willamere and Fleur. Hundreds upon hundreds of students walking along Willamere, which has no sidewalks, before and after classes at Brody, and countless flooding events along Willamere, including just two weekends ago when the new Fleur storm sewers just couldn't keep up and caused localized flooding along Willamere. To increase density at this location would be detrimental to the well-established neighborhood. The addition of 15 units, along with 60 car stalls, would more than double the entire density of the Willamere block. Yes, I understand 60 additional cars may not be a big deal to Fleur Drive, but these cars are not entering Fleur, they're entering Willamere Drive. To add on to Paula's information that we have over 300 signatures in opposition, it's important for you to know that this includes 100% of Willamere Drive and Southwest 22nd residents. And of, of the 17 houses in the 200 foot range, 16 of them are in opposition. The only one who supports this project lives directly north of de the development and at the planning and zoning meeting made it clear that they only support the project in hopes of selling their home for a payday. I understand increasing density as a priority in the plan DSM. However, the city should not compromise the neighborhood's historical values and character at the expense of the residents to achieve these goals. Thank you. Are there any other parties in interest? I ask you to come up. Uh, my name is Kevin Lammer. I'm at 3006, the property just north. And that previous statement wasn't true. I have no plans to sell within the near future. Um, 
I stated the only reason we didn't have a deal was because uh, the only reason I didn't sell my place was because I don't know, I heard somebody just say something when it was supposed to about it was on the record, so I'm trying to make sure it's right, but it it's I didn't sell because we didn't have a the right deal and we still don't, which means I still have no plan of selling in the near future at all. So that's completely irrelevant. I actually have concerns myself. If we choose alternative B, I'm actually concerned exactly what conditions. I mean, that's pretty big. It's very big. It says subject to conditions acceptable by the city and the owners. So I mean, what are said conditions anyway? I mean, A is pretty clear. I don't know if that question can be answered by any of you or if I, because that's, I think that's pretty important. You know, what, what exact the conditions would be. Yeah, we, we need to have uh, staff come forward. Mike, if you could, unless you're familiar with it. Because I'm pretty neutral right now, to be honest. Like, you know, what's transpired over the course of the last, you know, couple of weeks. So, I mean, alternative B doesn't seem like it's pretty, like it's cut and dry at all, to be honest. And that's concerning. So, Mayor and Council Members, the if if uh, choice B is selected, that simply starts the process for the negotiations to take place uh, to see if if those conditions would be acceptable to both parties. Okay. And so that those have not been set All at right. this point. It starts that process. All right. I guess that's the only question I had. Mike, the question was, uh, and the manager um, made a bit of a statement on it, but it says subject to um, conditions uh, acceptable. And uh, as the manager said, that starts a process. Could you quickly highlight what would happen if alternative B was selected and where does it go from there and how are the conditions created and where does it go? Does it go back to P and Z or does it end up back here after the, the conditions are created? Mayor, County members of the council, Michael Ludwig, Deputy Director of Development Services for the City of Des Moines. Uh, based on direction we would receive tonight from council, the roll call could be prepared and, and placed on, an, on a, a continued agenda. Uh, with public notice, the, the agenda is published so people could review those conditions as well. Um, under state law, the owner of a property has to agree to any conditions in writing prior to the close of the hearing. So that's why the hearing would be continued to a date specific and we would take your direction and, and draft conditions that would deem appropriate. We'd bring those back if those were signed uh, by the applicant. And again, it would be posted on, uh, on the uh, city's website on the agenda and then the council would continue the hearing and make a decision at that point. There would be opportunity for comment at that hearing. Council, any questions from us? Just does that clarify um, that point to everyone in the audience? Or are there still questions about that? Essentially, we wouldn't be rezoning today. We would be rezoning um, with new conditions at the next hearing. Correct. It would be a continuation of the, of the hearing. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Mike, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other parties in interest? You're not quite in a party of an interest. If there are none, we'll ask uh, for germane comments from the general public. And if you'd like to step up first, step step forward. My name is Laura Coyle. She, her pronouns. I live at uh, 3109 Park Plaza Drive. It's a little bit over a block away from the proposed development. And I ask you to vote to deny the developer's request for rezoning for the proposed Oaks on Fleur project. 
Our current zoning is defined as to preserve the scale and character of residential neighborhoods developed predominantly during the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, and that need to protect our historical and architecturally significant homes still exists and has not changed. This proposal would change the scale and character of our neighborhood. You cannot replace these historic homes once they've been torn out. We purchased our home because we fell in love with our mid-century neighborhood. It is unique, like something you see in the movies from the 1960s where the kids run from yard to yard playing with each other. If you approve the zoning change request, these row homes will destroy the mid-century aesthetic of our neighborhood. The developer has stated he intends to continue to abide buy additional property in our neighborhood and request additional rezoning to bulldoze more and more of our homes and replace them with row homes. This is a slippery slope and if you... Thank you. Are there next speaker? Anyone else want to speak on this? Yes, sir. Step forward. And we'll say that uh, uh, the germane comments, um, you got one minute. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor, council members, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is George Davis. I'm president of the Southwestern Hills Neighborhood Association, and we support this project. We support this project because each year we are losing more and more citizens in our neighborhood that have no other housing options or home options once they sell their home, and so they head to the suburbs. This development is on a corridor, which is very important, and we support that all the way. We support housing, and we want to keep the residents of Des Moines in Des Moines, especially in our neighborhood. We've held several open meetings on this, and I'm very much aware of, of uh, the uh, criterion of, of this project. And we've held, like I said, we've had three, we've had four different board meetings, we've had three different open neighborhood meetings on this, some is, uh, attended by as many as 100 people, which was voted down, and so the developer moved to a different area, and we support that. Thank you. Any other speakers? Step forward, sir. Hello, my name is Matt Morrow, and I'm a licensed broker, a real estate broker in Des Moines for 27 years. I actually grew up in this area. I have a lot of friends and family and have serviced this area as where my sphere is for a long, long time. Um, we don't have enough options for the 60 plus to have uh, units like this. There is a high demand for it beyond inventory being low, people want to stay in this area. They want maintenance-free living. These have proposed elevators in them to keep them. Um, and, and I also believe that what's, what's being missed here is these two stories, like Mr. Davis has been in for 35 years. They, we have to resell these homes and keep these, na these, these neighborhoods vibrant with new families coming in and, and enrolling in the school system. We're losing them to West Des Moines and Waukee and Ankeny because it's their only options. So having a, a friends, family that live in the area, and having a petition of over 50-some uh, immediate re residents that, that, that are in support of this project, I hope you strongly consider approving it. Next person. Hi, my name is Penny Harrison, and I am on the Southern Hills Neighborhood Association Board, also a realtor, not representing the builder. Um, like, like it's been said uh, that they were stack and pack um, buildings, they are not. They are very classy and there is a need for this type of homes um, in our neighborhood. People are moving out and I truly believe that people will like to live here and um, they are very affordable, but they are not low income. It has been said on Facebook uh, that some of the homes might bring low income housing. That is not the case here, they're in the mid 400s to 500,000s. Thank you. Next. You got 450 laying around. Oh, shit. Um, Taylor Weber, Ward 3. Uh, so I, I vehemently also disagree with this project as someone new to the area in Watcher South. Uh, I, I would like to see uh, more compact homes in general. Uh, we've got an item on the agenda tonight for Gray's Lake that we're redeveloping and redistricting, and that seems like a great area to put a lot of really affordable housing that we're really packing that density in. As we saw a couple weeks ago, this exact area flooded aggressively, even with the most money we've ever spent on stormwater management. We still failed to do that. So continuing to develop and, and reconstruct there when we're already failing on infrastructure is bad 
let alone all the great points that have been brought up. Uh, also, again, neighborhood associations do not represent uh, the best interests of people. Uh, everyone speaking out on favor of this project is for money and profits. The people who spent their time in the community going out did it for free. They knocked doors to bring dissent and aggressive dissent at every point in their process. Next speaker. Is it? Uh, there you go. My name is Walter Caldas. I just moved to 3118 Southwest 22nd Street, right there by Will O'Meara. And the reason why I moved two years ago there is because of the characteristics that the neighborhood offered. I went there, I toured the entire neighborhood, I liked what I saw, and now it's about to change. I'm here to ask you not to do that. The number should speak for itself. We have a lot more people present here, unsatisfied with the project, and the numbers the, the names of people that signed should speak for itself. The developer said that it's sad to see people wanting to live there, and they cannot, but I think it's the opposite. We are going to lose more people than what we are going to get. We are going to lose the people that are there because of what the neighborhood represents for us. I see people, kids walking in the street. It's calm. It's safe. And I'm afraid it's going to change with this new development. So the number should speak for itself. The reason why he's asking to rezone, it's because it was not meant to be. Next speaker. Uh, my name is John Shellness. I'm a board member of the Southwestern Hills Neighborhood Association. I live on Southwest 31st. Because of my interest and expertise in crime prevention and that the urging of the former director of the Iowa Fusion Center and Iowa Department of Public Safety, I joined the board of the Southwest Hills, Western Hills Neighborhood Association over 10 years ago. Research suggests that active neighborhood associations bring crime rates down, improving the quality of life. It's more than a coincidental that the Southwestern Hills is the safest neighborhood in the city and also has the largest and most active neighborhood association. For years, Southwestern Hills Hills residents have voiced interest in middle housing in our neighborhood so they can stay in the area when they are older. The city of Des Moines is addressing this by setting a policy to create more middle housing. I voted to support this project because it will provide this type of housing for members of our neighborhood which will improve the overall quality of life and reduce crime rates further. Next speaker. Your Honor, that was seven speakers over seven minutes. All right. Council. Your Honor, I'm, I'm willing, I don't know how many more speakers there are, but I'm willing if there are more, more speakers to allow more speakers on this item. Can we see how many more people would want to speak on this? So I'll move to allow three more speakers. Okay, three more speakers. Uh, Abby Banks, she, her, Ward 3, 50312, just move. Um, I am a sociology major at Drake. A lot of you guys know that. Um, I'm taking a class called the Sociology of the Black Experience. Um, and last week we just learned about housing and housing discrimination. Um, and something that really stuck out to me was that the literal textbook root of neighborhood associations was to keep black residents out. Like from a college class, like if you have an issue with that, you take that up with the like person who wrote that academic paper, but like that's the real root. So I just urge you as someone who is opposed to this project um, and doesn't know a single person that can afford a $500,000 townhome um, to just think critically about who you're hearing from. Uh, you're either hearing from the people whose roots are keeping black people out of communities historically, or you're hearing from the people that are affected. Yep. Hello, speaker. my name is Adam, um, Ward 3. I wanted to talk on this because I, I heard something that's come up multiple times, which is this idea that we need to somehow change things in our city against the wishes of the people that do live here and want to stay here in order to accommodate people that already want to move to the suburbs. 
Um, and while like I, I would love more people to be staying here or moving here, I just think it's really odd that we have people that we know are speaking and they want to stay here. They love their neighborhoods right now and we're trying to change it to get people like who want to move to the suburbs instead. I just think we need to listen to um, the voice of the residents and not developers and other groups that have other have other motivations. Did we have one more? It strikes me kind of funny tonight that we've got the board members here and the real estate agent that is for it. The rest of us are against it. When the N14 rezoning this, when you've got just west of McGray Park, he says they're sold, and I know Benskins is not sold out, and I know Frank Skyone is not sold out. Those are already zoned that area, and if you want to put them there, that's what we suggest. Then you've got the view of the downtown area of what you're trying to do. That's all I've got to say. Can we get your name, please? Uh, Ma'am? Ma'am? Uh, yeah. Yes, please. It, okay, and your 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 ward and your zip code. Oh, five zero three one five. I don't know what my ward is. You're, I live across from Milconda Golf Course on Southwest Fourteen. Your ward three. I don't pay attention to that. I just. <laughs> okay. Council member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you to everyone who has been a part of the conversation about this project. Uh, some of the most challenging issues that we deal with as a council are zoning issues. Uh, you know, projects like this, they directly impact neighbors and they shape the future of what our community might be. And we all take that responsibility very seriously. Uh, and I think the process that this project has gone through, uh, it's actually been one of the more intensive uh, processes that, that I've seen a project go through. There have been three pretty rigorous neighborhood meetings. Uh, and it shows, I think, at least a little bit of the evolution of this project. Uh, the first neighborhood meeting was looking at uh, a similar project on the corner of Park and Fleur. Uh, and that was uh, probably the, I know there are a lot of folks here tonight, but that was probably the best attended of the, the neighborhood meetings. Uh, there were a large number of people there, uh, and it was very clear the concerns that were expressed, not just by the neighbors, but by the neighborhood association. Uh, what happened after that meeting uh, is I think at least some of the concerns were heard and addressed and the project changed. The location changed, there were some modifications made. Uh, that was not enough, obviously, to satisfy all of the neighbors. We, we have still heard from a lot of folks who who have concern and opposition, but it did, uh, those changes did lead to uh, others, including the neighborhood association, but it's broader than just the folks in the neighborhood association who, who I've heard from. I've heard from folks who live nearby and who also have a potential interest uh, in this project, or who have interest in projects like this, um, quite honestly, that would be a bit more affordable but it's the form uh, that folks want to see more projects like this um, that we're starting to hear from. Uh, and then uh, even after, after that, there was a third neighborhood meeting uh, where uh, the developer uh, presented additional changes, uh, particularly to uh, several of the homes that are essentially in the, the secondary layer of these homes to um, 
make those a lower height limit. Uh, and that was presented, uh, that, that meeting was presented to, to neighbors who were, uh, I think it was the 250 foot uh, limit, were invited to that meeting. I was at all three of those meetings. Um, and I know there are, there are a mix of folks, the people who, uh, who I've seen who feel strongest, uh, a number of them are, are here tonight. Uh, and I, under, I understand that. Uh, I understand the concerns that folks have. Um, but part of my job is to put this in the larger context. And I wanna talk about a couple of those, of those pieces. Um, one of which, uh, I firmly believe that our community has a need for more housing. And I think that extends, we need more housing of all types. Uh, that includes uh, more density, more apartments, more affordable housing. It includes uh, pieces like this project that are uh, the missing middle. Uh, and the missing middle refers, refers to a form. Uh, you know, row homes like this are part of the missing middle. Uh, but part of the goal of getting projects like this is that it doesn't just stop here with a project like this, but it allows us to add more affordability going forward. And, and that's what this form hopefully can do and why a project like this, even if it doesn't have affordability, why it is beneficial uh, to the overall community in that regard. So in, in that regard, uh, I think this project provides value because we need more housing, we need more options, uh, and I think this housing fills that role. I also want to talk about this corridor in, in, in specific. You know, this is on the Fleur Drive corridor. Uh, it's one of the busiest corridors in all of our city. There are over 34,000 vehicles that go through this corridor where this project would be uh, on any given day. Uh, and not only that, but within, uh, within essentially a block and a half of this project, we have multiple apartment buildings. Uh, we have uh, one of the tallest condo buildings in the city. And we have several different townhome projects. So we have a range of densities that complement the single family homes that are in the neighborhood. This area already has density. This area is appropriate for density. Uh, and quite honestly, if we don't build density on corridors like this, uh, while folks have pointed out that we have areas in the uh, south of Grays Lake master plan, areas downtown where we build density, but if we cannot build density on corridors like this, there are very few corridors uh, that I think folks could say would be appropriate for density, and I think that's a problem for our community over the long run. I think we need density on our corridors, not just in downtown, and I think uh, continuing to work and allow density in areas like this part of Fleur Drive that add a range and add to what we currently have uh, is an appropriate way to, to modify our zoning, and it fits with our long-term vision and what we are trying to do as a city. Uh, I also wanted to address one of, one of the specific concerns that I've heard uh, that, that I don't think has been fully addressed yet, but that I think we can handle uh, in our action tonight as a council, uh, and that is the safety on Willamere. Uh, I think that is very much a real issue uh, you know, one of the things that we have been working on as a council is to fill in priority one sidewalk gaps uh, to make it so that there are safe walking routes to schools and to transit stops. This stretch of Willamere is a perfect example of a priority one sidewalk gap. Uh, you have a transit route on Fleur Drive, and I will say I would love that transit route to, to be a more frequent transit route. Um, and then you also have Brody Middle School on the other side of this. Uh, I know that 
This is on our list as we are working through Priority One sidewalks. Uh, my understanding from conversation with uh, engineering is that this is currently scheduled in the 2026 timeframe. Uh, I would like us to address that by, by uh, as part of this action, requesting to move this sidewalk gap up uh, as much as we can. Uh, I think staff have said that uh, this could potentially start construction as early as 2024. Uh, and I think that would go a long way to helping address uh, the safety on Willamere, and I think that's an important step that we can take uh, as, we, as we look at this project. Uh, so with that, uh, I would move uh, alternative B uh, to approve this, uh, and I would add to that motion uh, to direct or request and direct from staff uh, to accelerate uh, the priority one sidewalk uh, gap on this particular project so that it is uh, completed uh, as soon as possible. If we could have a second, if we could have just a little bit more discussion on this, this, I, I'm kind of stuck here because I care very much about what the neighborhood wants to happen in their area, what, what, what is needed, things like that. And then I'm also looking at the other side of this where we're putting in like hugely expensive cond or, or, or townhomes. And what, what I'm looking at is, is what's, what's really confusing to me is that this is a, a major, major street. It's a huge corridor. And I, there's neighborhood on either side of it, but it is a huge corridor that a huge portion of our city and visitors are, are going down every single day. And so density seems fitting for this area. Um, but the debate here is between like maintaining a very nice, very nice neighborhood and putting in extremely expensive condos and I per or townhomes, excuse me. And I personally, when we're talking about building density, I personally would rather be building density that isn't in that extremely high price point. Um, I, I understand the point that, um, that that housing is needed across the board, but it, it, we're not going to be like at a loss of finding people who want to build in the $500,000 range. Like all developers are going to want to be building in the $500,000 range because you get a bigger return on investment in that way. Um, wh what I guess is, is, is my question to the neighbors though is if we're not building this on floor, where, where do we build it? Why, why not in your neighborhood? Why, why not in, it, like it's gonna happen in all of our neighborhoods, right? If we are at such a loss for housing, why not in our neighborhoods on these huge corridors? Most of the houses around this project are single story ranch homes. This thing will overshadow and pack the entire neighborhoods around it. So that's why, you know, <laughs> Mayor, I'm sorry, I can't hear any comments. Yeah. Can they go to the podium? We're not having a discussion. I think we need to hear what you have to say, and I appreciate uh, um, the speaker, but no. Essentially, the, the, the gist of what was, of what was being said was that this is going to overshadow mm -hmm. the neighborhood. Yeah. And I guess I don't completely see how that is in that, like, once you go back past the corridor, you're in your neighborhood. If we're, if we are improving the safety issues, if we are addressing some of these other issues that are going to come up, um, I, I, I just, like, we don't live in a suburb. We can't completely, like, say, like, we're going to have these single-family neighborhoods everywhere. We're taking a, a lot that could have been one house, two houses, and turning it into, what, 16? 14, sorry, 14. And if we're at such a loss for housing, I feel like what we're hearing over and over and over again is, well, not in my neighborhood, but somebody else can deal with it. And that concerns me. And when we're talking about like the racial dynamics, I, I agree, neighborhood associations um, were, were brought into existence to uh, essentially uphold the redlining of neighborhoods. That is not really a disputable fact. Um, but I, I do think that we are dealing with two sides of the same issue here. Like we are dealing with, you know, wanting to keep, um, keep our, our neighborhood in this really like, honestly like middle high income area and then saying like, but we don't want density. Um, and, and this concern being brought up that like, oh, don't worry, low income people aren't coming here. Why not? Why not in your neighborhood? Why, why shouldn't we be building low income 
low-income housing in our neighborhoods? Why shouldn't we be going back from like this neighborhood that was built in the 1950s, going back from the trend of how neighborhoods were built in the 1950s and adding diversity into our neighborhoods and not restricting people to come and live in our neighborhoods. So my concern really here is with the price point. Um, and I would open it up to, are we, we said we can ask him back for questions. I don't know if we're allowed to do that. As a developer. Yeah, okay. So I would ask why we are building at such a high price point. Why can't we build at a lower price point? No. I don't think no. I'm allowed to ask anybody else. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate all your feedback here. Um, so right down the street, are you familiar with the Pinnacle on Fleur? I don't it's, know the names of buildings. I just know I just drive by them. So it's just to the north of the apartments. Okay. Um, Kimberly has a proposed development that's on the MLS right now for $1.4 million, and they are row homes, townhomes. So this, although it is expensive, um, I, I would rather them be, I can't get them under four hundred. I just can't. With the cost of construction, with the lot acquisition, I, I don't want them to be that. I really don't. It's not about profit margins. It really isn't. I want them to be, it's not. It isn't. Sorry. This is not about, this is about, this is about the cost of construction and the quality of construction. I mean, these are brick, these are, these are stucco, these are all energy, electrical vehicle charging stations, spray foam ceiling, R20 sidewalls. I mean, these are well-built um, construction on our main corridor, and it needs to be well-built construction, just as the park floor is well-built, and, and it's just the cost to build is ex really high right now. Um, so what I what I have learned about this project is that they're being sold as smart homes. That seems like an extra cost above what would need to be done. I, I approve of the all electric. I'm I'm in support of that. But smart home seems like another layer above that. So so the smart home is kind of nominal. The total cost per unit on a smart home is about fifteen hundred dollars. So what that means is just upgrading your smoke detectors to smart smoke detectors and thermostats and garage door openers and doorbells and house locks. So all of those accessories equal about 1500 per unit. So it's, that's just a little nominal as far as having that smart home. You said 1500 per unit? Per unit. So, yeah. So I guess I hear what you're saying and the cost of building is going up. Um, and I do want quality buildings um, in our city. At the same time, I know that people are able to build quality buildings at a lower price, so my concern still exists here. Right. Um, I think that balancing essentially the the needs of our city to build housing and balancing the desires of the neighbors to have control over what's happening um, since alternative B would include coming back with conditions acceptable to the city and the owners I think that the city being the representative of the people should uh, discuss those conditions with the neighborhood I would request another neighborhood meeting to discuss the conditions of this uh, rezoning of the development to find something that would work for everyone would you be willing to add that to your motion? So I don't, there have been three neighborhood meetings that, that I've attended. The folks who, who are opposed are opposed to this level of density mm -hmm. as near as I can tell. I mean, uh, I've asked some of them, the response has been that they'd support single family homes in, in this area. There have not been suggestions for design changes that uh, that would accommodate that uh, and the conditions traditionally we would have to set any conditions if there were additional design changes that that we feel are necessary uh, which we would have to set those today I, I believe that is the direction Do well, we? the, the directions would be most helpful for council to tell us what, what you want in the conditions, sure. Right. I, most helpful but necessary? Because if we are, if the conversation in three neighborhood meetings was yes or no, the conversation now is how can we make this, you know, part of our neighborhood that we're not going to hate, right? Um, and I did see there was some feedback uh, of the design style. And so I wonder if there's further conversation to be had there if we are drawing this line and saying, yes, we're going to rezone. Secondary so, sorry, can you speak into the microphone? Could I just ask Councilmember Shoemaker uh, a, a question? Is she asking that we lower the price points of these homes on Fleur Drive or these condos or, or townhomes 
Is that is that what you're asking? Not in this specific um, conversation. I'm asking that um, if we are drawing the line and rezoning, uh, that the conditions acceptable by the city would also be the conditions acceptable by the neighborhood to build this development. I am also just making a point that I do not agree with the high price point uh, for this development, but I don't know that that is avoidable. Okay, well, typically at the council table, we're, we're not setting price points, the market does, so. Yeah, no, I'm not uh, setting a price point. Uh, unfortunately, being, being on the council, it is very unfortunate that we will never make every single resident in the city happy with the decision that we make. We can sure do our, our job. We have so many different needs, but we have so much more input. So I, I'm, I'm not sure where this discussion is going. I, if there's a, if we need a second motion, uh, I will second John. I already motion. had second. No, it's already seconded. I don't know if anybody okay. heard it, but I did second. Yep, you did. I got it. Adam, I've All got right. a question for you, yeah. unless anybody else has anything. I appreciate your changing and listening to uh, uh, some of the neighbors' concerns and, and looking at the design and that. But as I um, listened to your presentation the other night and uh, um, other discussions that, that I have had around this, Adam, the sidewalk that is going to be constructed on Fleur Drive, on the west side of Fleur Drive, how far off of that sidewalk are your units? So I met with Brett to this morning, actually, and the contractor on site on Fleur, and they met with Mr. Lammer as well. Uh, to, they're working very well with me. I said, let's not do anything until we get the rezoning, but they're working with me and listening and wanting to accommodate this development. It's proposed to be at the minimum setback, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. The oak tree... Okay, the minimum is you, the other night at the meeting, you said it was 12 feet. The minimum setback, yes, for this type of zoning, for an X1 to be 12 feet. So it would be essentially a fence, a, a five foot private sidewalk, and then the a steps up to their front door to like a stoop. So it'd be, it'd be forward facing um, toward on floor, which is consistent with this type of zoning. I wouldn't need a type two variance on this. Yeah, but who's going to come up there? I mean, they're going to enter that off that driveway. I mean, you the and I know drive's coming from behind. So my concern is, is we think about it, and I look at some of the other, um, as you explained, high-density properties around, and we'll even use the park floor. It was built about the same time as many of these homes that are in there, and it is set back significantly further than 12 feet from the sidewalk, and I'm a little concerned about not only the safety of people using the sidewalk and in with a wall right there, and then uh, we're, you know, to one of the points uh, the other night, where does the snow go, what happens, what do you do with it, because the snow's gonna get piled up on the public sidewalk out there, and with only 12 feet there, I, I just, it's hard for me to get my arms around how this, feels in the neighborhood and uh, I've listened to the neighbors and uh, as we discussed I've spent quite a deal of my life in in that area and uh, I you know including living there I just um, this is is a totally different concept than anything else that's there so tell me how we're gonna mitigate that closeness almost a wall up on floor drive yeah, I appreciate your concern. So the, the wall will be at the maximum allowable height of four feet. Um, Brent Miller is going to increase the wall height to the, to the four, maximum height of four feet. Then there'll be a black fence to match the area on top of that wall, which will be privately owned. And then you'll have a uh, green space or a planter with, with a hedge and then a private sidewalk on top of that. And I can push them back as much as I can, but I've got the oak tree. So everything is dependent on that oak tree. And I'm, right now I'm proposing a 16 foot driveway. I can reduce that to 14 and I could possibly reduce the lane that goes in between, um, that goes behind those, reduce that by a foot or two. So there's, there's, there's room to gain a little more to get it off, 
but it's that oak tree that that we're trying to preserve on site that is that is forcing that to building forward because the the main lane is I believe 20 feet and the driveways are 16 feet and the building is 36 feet so I have 36 I I used to know these numbers but 36 56 it's like 84 feet or something from the front of the building to the to the back side of the lane and that leaves me maybe 10 feet to the trunk of the oak tree um, I've had an arborist on site they're not super happy about it but said there's a chance that the, the tree would would live with with our design and um, it's a it's a pretty special tree what's the age of the oak tree it's over 100 years old <laughs> okay anybody else have any other questions mr. mayor can I uh, can I just wrap up so we're we're putting the sidewalk down for a drive this year correct on that side of the street is that right yes yes yes, yes. we think okay. so okay no we we are the and, wall and is so, in progress right now the retaining wall. right so now adam are you telling us you're not going to put a sidewalk on willamere i will be can, extending the public sidewalk on willamere along with the retaining wall as well as um, having a private sidewalk for the resident's front door that would be on top of the development that would be behind the fence. So I would be putting a so, sidewalk along Willamere. Okay, so you're gonna have a public sidewalk. So then what we, what we need to do, and, and, and I'm completely in favor in, in getting engineering to move it up, this is a priority one. There needs to be sidewalks around Brody. Um, and so we, we need to do our part and to make that area safer after you put your sidewalk in and we finished doing ours on Fleur Drive. And so I, I think, Josh, you made that part of your motion, didn't you? I, I did make that part of the motion. Okay. The only, real, the only issue is, which I don't know if it's an issue, the engineering can deal with it. The proposed sidewalk is actually on the south side of Willowmere planned. So I would expect that engineering would change that to the north side of Willowmere to connect to the sidewalk that would be installed as part of the development. But that's small details, I expect. Or it could go on both yep. sides. Or both sides. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, I would suggest we put it on both sides of the road. But definitely, I think we finish what you put in for sure. And then if we want to go, I mean, I, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's pretty easy to take care of. And real quick, I, I was up here to speak to Ms. Shoemaker. Um, the, the secondary buildings that I've redesigned to a two-story, like mm -hmm. the ones I propose in your ward, mm -hmm. I haven't set those price points, but those will be less than the primary building on Fleur because it's a two-story unit, um, so they will be less than the, the main building. And both it'll be both a different of design. the two back buildings? The two back buildings, correct. And those the will be a two front building is three-story? Correct. Okay. And, and I didn't get a chance to uh, uh, speak on the design of the front building. We've got AIB which is a very similar design. We have the Pinnacle on Fleur, which is planned, which is the same architect that I'm using on the corner of Willowmere. So it's my vision that this corridor has a very similar architecture as you drive down between Willowmere, Willowmere and Bell. Mr. Mayor, I mean, would you want, would you want us to add a condition that uh, we ask staff to work with the developer on additional setback uh, I, I yeah that's a great concern of mine and uh, I you and I've talked about it and um, I mentioned it again here tonight I just um, yeah it just seems like we're building a I, I mean I 40 think story wall part of it set back um, with what four feet or whatever it is that that wall on the sidewalk is and then a three-story building behind that the setback would be on with the back of the wall. It'd be from the back of the wall. Right, 12 feet. Right. Feet from the with wall. a bush and a sidewalk and a something else in there it, to get it, to the front door. I mean, I, I'm comfortable with the minimum setback, but if it would make you more comfortable, I'm happy to ask staff to direct uh, that as a potential condition. The trade-off is potentially losing the oak tree, which I would prefer not to 
uh, lose the mature oak tree. It sounds like the arborists are already concerned that you're going to lose it anyway with all the ground moving and we're how many feet away from it? 15 feet? Yeah. 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 Which I'd be about a little more than outside two thirds of the, the, the camp. I mean, we're a tree city USA, so I'm fully in support of saving all the trees. But in the meantime, um, you know, you get over a hundred year old oak and we're going to mess around with the root system and how it gets everything else. Those driveways. I don't have to have 16 feet, and we can um, reduce the lane by a couple feet. I mean, I could get maybe five feet. And and what'd you say? There's 14, 15 units. Yes. 14 units. And I mean, it says right. 14 here, but he said 15. I think tonight. It's but staff. and this is what a three quarters of an acre total that you got. Yes. So, so I have a plenty of room in the northwest corner of this, but that's the secondary reason that this oak tree is really, you know, this zoning is meant to have the building pushed toward the front, yeah. this type of zone. Well, we occasionally um, have debates around, especially in a single family neighborhood, of putting duplexes on 1.8 acres. And, you know, here we're putting 14 units on eight tenths of an acre. Elevate, uh, the, the Elevate is, has 18 units on 38,000 square feet with the same zoning down on Thomas Beck. I will just point out we don't really have a public record of the conversation if you're not speaking into the microphone. This is not recorded by the anything. Sorry. The townhome project on uh, Southwest 7th and Thomas Beck is that's eight, yours, that's yes, your townhome, the Elevate yeah. townhome project is 18 units on 38,000 square feet. This is would be proposed as 15 units on 42,000 square feet. So the density works in this in this scenario. And where the bar is, the 508 bar, that's 26,000 square feet of land. When the bar is demoed, there'll be 11 units on 26,000 square feet. So um, the density works in this type of cons row home construction. So, well, depending on how you build it, there's probably 100 units on the park floor. So, right. And it's still set back more than 12 feet, like 50 or 75 or 100. Yeah. I just, it's a tough feel for me. Okay. You've got a motion. Can I make one more proposal? Sorry, I, I do have concerns about um, the flooding issue that was brought up. I've seen, you know, even small new developments that have caused uh, more flooding than previously. So, just if we could have engineering and public works looking at that issue as this goes through as well. Isn't that part of conditions? That on? that that is, yeah, just ab to make absolutely. A specific we we note can make sure to have engineering and public works look at this from a stormwater perspective to make sure we're incorporating best practices uh, into this project and that can be part of the condition with with the note that like it was it's been brought up as an issue previously so it you know if there there may, may be a current issue that could be exacerbated yep. okay it's been moved and seconded Joe Oh, yes, Your Honor. Six yes, one no. Mo motion carries. All right. Now, I think it's good. what's going to happen is it's going to come back with hopefully some mitigation of some of the concerns. So um, with that, the item passes, and we'll move on to item 63. <clears throat> item 63 is on a request from Wendy Steppes and Dave Steppes uh, to amend Plan DSM, creating our tomorrow future land use designation for property located at 514 Foster Drive and from parks 
and open space to low density residential and to allow rezoning from P2 public civic and institutional district to a limited N1A neighborhood district to allow combining with adjacent property for construction of a cabana. A is the first consideration of the ordinance above. B is the final consideration of the ordinance above the waivers requested by Wendy Steffes and David Steffes and requires six votes. Uh, we'll ask first for parties in interest to step up. Are there any parties in interest? Seeing none, let's open it up. Um, For germane comments from the general public, uh, um, one minute apiece for anyone who would like to speak on this item. Seeing none. Seeing none, Mr. Mayor, I'll move items 63, 63A, and 63B. I'll, I'll second, second that. It. It's been moved and seconded. I'll ask everyone to vote. Vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 64, items regarding the airport Coles Drive reconstruction phase two project. A, on the Fifth Amendment to the Real Estate Lease and Asset Transfer Agreement to exclude excess property adjoining Fleur Drive between Highview Drive and McKinley Avenue and to include property located west of and adjoining Southwest 46th Street north of McKinley Avenue. Uh, B is a resolution dedicating additional Fleur Drive right away as part of the Airport Coles Drive Reconstruction Phase 2 project. Uh, we'll ask uh, germane comments from the general public. Um, again, one minute per person to speak on this one regarding airport Coles Drive reconstruction. Seeing none. Seeing none, Mr. Mayor, I'll move item 64A and 64B. I'll second it. Been moved and seconded. I'll vote yes, Your Honor. Get on here. <laughs> Linda? Oh, oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 65 on a city initiated uh, request to amend the existing plan DSM, creating our tomorrow comprehensive future land use plan to adopt the South of Grays Lake Master Plan as an element. Council communication number 22-139. Again, germane comments from the public. One minute, anybody wants to speak about this one? Step forward, sir. Taylor Weber, 4-3, uh, 503 um, Yeah, so, the master plan is interesting. It's only a 104 page PDF, but I'm sure all you guys read all of it with everything uh, else going on. Uh, my biggest concern here is that this district is, is more, like, more likely than not gonna get used uh, for tax abatement, stiff money for developers. As we see, you are very apt to vote in favor of those things already, uh, given the history uh, in general, as well as your actions tonight. But this is a great area for development there's lots of green space that we can make quality, affordable housing, walkable areas here. There's no reason we need to be uh, pushing people out of this uh, community like we've been talking about. Uh, so I would really encourage that there's nothing in here that says we're actually gonna make this area affordable or make sure we can attract uh, people that actually wanna come and live here to this. So uh, I don't think you're gonna change anything, but I would encourage you to actually make sure we use tax dollars to benefit there are there any other speakers? Again. South of Grays Lake. Seeing none, we get a motion. Yeah, I, Mr. Mayor, I'm 
happy to, to move this item. Uh, this is another example. There was uh, public process and public comment. Um, I, and uh, I think we got a, a lot of very good public comment, and I think that's reflected in a master plan that has, again, a mix of densities and mixed use, and will take an area of our town, if we can realize it, uh, and it's an underutilized area, and it's an area that has potential to connect well and be a gateway from uh, downtown to the south side. Uh, and, and I think the, the point that Mr. Weber made about affordability is an important one. Uh, but the way, that, the way that we're going to get affordability, uh, or a piece of it, uh, we have been working on uh, when we have multifamily projects that we provide incentives, uh, mainly TIF, uh, we have been requiring affordability. And, and we should be requiring more affordability and getting it down to a better affordability point. Uh, that means 10% uh, of units getting down into the 50% of AMI and then another 10% that may go up to 80% AMI. And there is an opportunity there because I think affordability works better when you integrate it in everywhere rather than isolate it. Uh, and when we build uh, when we build a new neighborhood like this master plan, South of Grays Lake master plan presents an opportunity to do, we have a great opportunity to integrate affordability throughout uh, so that we serve more of our community. And again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. I firmly believe we need more housing, period. Uh, and uh, the South of Grays Lake master plan represents another opportunity to add that housing. We're not going to be there even with, if we fully build out the south of Grays Lake area, we still need even greater density in parts of our downtown. We've got a lot of work to do to be able to provide the housing that we know our community needs, uh, and this is a part of it. So I'm happy to move item 65. I'll second it. Been moved and seconded. Ask everyone to vote. Joe? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Moves us to item 66. Item 66 on a lease agreement with the Des Moines Historical Society for a portion of the vacated parkland located south of University Avenue at the northeast corner of the Waveland Golf Course. Uh, Council communication number 22 128. A, on a request from Shive Hattery for a certificate of appropriateness for the Waveland trolley loop commemorative sculpture and interpretive site located in the 4900 block of university avenue uh, we'll ask uh, if there are any germane comments uh, regarding this historic site hello denver she her uh, Ward 3, I live right on 42nd in Ingersoll, so I do go down to Waveland Tap, and the business is down there pretty regularly. I also drive along that corridor every day going to back into from work. Um, I think this is a really cool idea. I'm really down for it. Something that kind of considered, like, makes me kind of hesitant is it says it's supposed to be interactive site. I don't really know what that means if it's going to be geared more towards children, which I think is great because across the street there is like low income apartment complexes um, and there's no parks besides the golf course, which you need money to golf um, or the cemetery and you need to be dead to use a cemetery. So I just worry because that is like a big, a lot of people do speed through there. So I, I'm worried about children's safety um, and also um, if it's going through the public golf course, so they're getting it from the golf course or they're getting it from the city. Or is it like the city's land? Or is it just a vacant lot? Or is it part of the golf course? I guess those are my two things. It's part of the city's land. Well, I think there's some folks from the project who, who are here to say a few words and they might want to uh, address some of that because I think it's a great project and it's an opportunity for folks to learn a little bit more about all the good work. Yep. Is there anybody here from doing. the project that would like to speak? We'll ask you to step up at this time. You guys will have to tag team it. You each got a minute. <laughs> mm 
Uh, good evening. I, gu I guess the mic's on. I'm Robert Gurness. I live at 1011 45th Street. That's Ward 3. Uh, 50311 is the zip code. I've been, uh, I'm one of the three co chairs of the Waveland Trolley Loop Project Committee, and I'm also going to be on the Trolley Loop Foundation, uh, Waveland Trolley Loop Foundation Board, so which we're working on. Uh, we, we, Initiated, I'm going to have Steve Stimmel, who's with the Des Moines Historical Society, do a, fill you in on some details. But we've been working on this for about five years. Uh, we've collected quite a bit of money. We, we saw the purpose of this was to, three purposes to fulfill. One was, the most important is to educate people about the trolley system in Des Moines at a designated landmark that was, a, that was honored by you folks as being part of the trolley system. Second is to, uh, improve the appearance of University Avenue and the neighborhoods around it by cleaning up a long neglected site that's city property. The, the third, it, which re will remain city property, and we'll hand it off. And that's to provide a, a node. You gotta give it to the guy behind you. Okay, go ahead. He can give, he can give number three. <laughs> to respond to the question, it is an interactive educational site, so there will be information to read, and there, because sculpture, it'll be a metallic sculpture, and you can actually roll up behind it on a ramp accessible to everybody, so people in chairs, children, and they can wave through the windows of this cutout type monument, the side view of a streetcar, and so it's very interactive, and it complements the city trail that is gonna be built along the south side of the university. The land is existing uh, non-used parkland, so it was vacated, so it's a little triangular piece, less than a, what, third of an acre, I think it was? So very small. Uh, it was declared a local landmark in 2017 because on that site are the rails underneath where the streetcars actually turned around. And there was a, a paved path that went over the top of the rails where the trolley buses also made their loop. That's why it's called a loop because it was at the end of the line where the streetcars reversed direction and went back downtown. So we hope it'll be very interactive. And I want to uh, mention Earl Short. Who All right. Thank you. And Earl was very important uh, piece of this. Go ahead, I, I think we see another speaker here. Taylor Weber, Ward 3. Um, no, I think this is a great project. I like the accessibility uh, aspect that we're taking into it. I think the safety concern is very real too. That's, that's a really busy traffic corridor. Uh, I would like to have a moment of silence for the fact that this type of transit doesn't exist in Des Moines anymore. Uh, this is a very, as, as one of my audience mates pointed out, a good in memoriam to things that would be nice to have around, affordable, accessible transportation for all, uh, especially in this area. I'd also like to point out we're working with a 20 year lease for this, that sounds great, it's nice and affordable, but uh, community fridges that have been in this area have been attacked and penalized uh, for $750 a month in fees uh, because they didn't meet zoning requirements and they were filling a community need as opposed to a landmark that's nice, but it's not feeding people. So, uh, cool project, I like it, but just be cool to put more energy towards things that are feeding people as well. All right, anyone else? Uh, Mayor County, if yeah. there's no other comments, I'd like to move this. I was also part of the committee for three years, and this is, I think we're ready to roll once we get these approvals to to start building it out. So with all expectations, this will be completed um, uh, by the end of this year. So with right. that, I would move. Uh, we need a second, I, I think. I would gladly. And A. Uh, I, yeah. I would gladly second that. And I, I just want to thank the committee of folks. I mean, it's been a volunteer effort, a, a labor of love to, to commemorate, commemorate this. Uh, and I think it, it'll be Really great to, to have this done. Uh, Carl, uh, Council Member Voss, I appreciate your work on this as well. Uh, and uh, it is a, a nice memorial to transit. We still have work to do uh, from a transit accessibility perspective and we'll keep, we'll keep working along those lines. I would just like to say because um, a lot of the decisions about this um, monument were made before I was on the council. Um, and so I was kind of watching these decisions be made, and I just have to say, like, it's it's going to be a beautiful project. It's it's going to be it's going to be really exciting, but it does make me really sad because uh, I, I grew up on an old trolley line, 
and to be that we're putting up memorials for them instead of you know reinstating public transit it's like look back at the time when we had public transit before we built out the highways in the 50s and everything became car centric it's I, so I'm going to be supporting it because I hope it brings attention <laughs> to um, that disparity and the fact that we had a different life not so long ago. Um, and hopefully more people can learn about that and um, start advocating for more public transit. All right, Joe. That vote, yes, Your Honor. No writing. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 67. It's on the 2021 U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development HUD Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, CAPER, uh, Council Communication Number 22-124. And uh, if anybody has any germane comments uh, about the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, we'd ask you to step forward at this time. Hello, my name is Adam Callanan. He and pronouns 50309, word three. Um, yeah, so I looked over some of this report. Um, there was a lot of good things, but I only have a minute to talk, so I'm going to talk about the areas where the city underdelivered, delivered um, in the hopes that we can get those things addressed for next year and in the future. Um, some of those things were um, we underdelivered on new rental housing units constructed, uh, homeowner housing units rehabilitated, households assisted with rabbit housing, and persons assisted by the emergency food distribution program. So that was in 2021, things that the city didn't do as well as it wanted to and it had set goals for, and um, hopefully next year we can um, end up on the other side of that. Taylor Weber, Ward 3. Uh, um, yeah, I think those are great points to point out. I think specifically diving into our goal for 2021 to assist persons um, with the emergency food distribution program, our goal was 7,800 people to help. Do you guys know how many we helped? Zero. We helped no, no. people. We didn't help at all. They used COVID money. Yeah. So it, we didn't even attempt to meet our goal in using this money uh, as we'd stated. So I would really encourage us to do like a lot better, like infinite percent better uh, because you're multiplying by zero. So math doesn't work great there. Uh, but I would, I would really encourage us to actually focus on diverting dollars to helping people. Uh, we're still hurting. We're still in a pandemic. I understand things are being reported as rosy, but that's not the case. So uh, people need real help and it'd be cool if we as a city helped. All right, could we get a motion? I'll move item uh, 67. And I did uh, ask too on this item that we get, um, uh, Chris Johansson was gonna put together what they're working out on the food with DMARC and some other agencies and to get a really a handle of how much of the COVID dollars were outlaid <coughs> because I know for rental assistance and a lot of those things, there's millions of dollars that went out. So we have a better picture of what we actually, who we did help and how many. Second on this motion. Right, it's been moved and seconded. I'll vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes, motion carries. 68, consideration of the recommended capital improvement program CIP for the fiscal years 2022 to 2023 through 2025 and 2026. Uh, Council communication number 22 126. Ask if I, anybody would like to speak from the general public. I mean, you want to speak, Mr. Manager, first? Well, I'd hate for Gloria to have to sit back down. If okay. You, if, if you wouldn't mind. Let's see what order. happens. <laughs> Thank you. As you all know from our written and oral reports last month, the Stormwater Infrastructure Advisory Committee, which I chair, anticipates that there are going to be many uh, major construction issues needed with stormwater for the next several years. We understand that several projects underway are already bonded for or funded, and we are, con but considering that there is no SIP increase for the coming year, I want to reiterate that over the next five years, there will be a substantial need for funding to complete the needed repairs in a timely manner for the safety and economic success of our city. 
and that includes the whole city. I get the page turned. Uh, also, uh, additional lost dollars just must be considered as this is the only source of ongoing funding other than the stormwater tax, the utility tax. And we understand that the distribution of... Gloria, your, your time is up. Thank you. Scott, do you want to make a comment and we'll ask for additional speakers? Sure, I, I appreciate it. And actually given the uh, long meeting time that we've had this far I'm in the interest of time, I'm actually going to shorten my comments here on the budget. Um, I really appreciate all the work that's been put into this year's budget. That includes the staff time, as you might imagine, an uh, incredible amount of, of time was spent with the uh, department directors, the finance staff, legal, and actually our communications as well. Uh, effort was put into additional public meeting and public input. That includes several workshops, both uh, in an in-person uh, format as well as online. There were listening posts added as well that gave us an opportunity to speak with the public directly at libraries and community centers. And then, of course, we had our website with surveying and the question asked about how best to provide services to our residents. Again, at a high level, there is no change in the property tax rate. Uh, there is um, commitment that continues through the local option sales tax to build strong neighborhoods. That includes uh, quite a bit of investment and services within our park and rec. Uh, with, that includes, you might imagine, everything from park equipment to spray grounds to trails. Uh, the commitment remains strong for public safety, which includes additional firefighters and uh, 911 dispatch uh, personnel as well. Uh, generally, Des Moines is a growing city, and as such, we also have administrative needs that need to get done. So this budget assures that there are appropriate staffing in the administrative areas as well, which as you might imagine includes IT. Um, finance, HR, and others. Uh, engineering and public works are highly uh, involved in everything from our stormwater sewers to street construction with our still record high amount of CIP, the capital improvement aspect. Uh, again, I could go on, but I'll just uh, open it up for questions that, that the council may have of me. Otherwise, we can get back to public comment. Mayor, thank you. Council, any quick? I think we need to finish public comment. Yep. Let's, uh, any other uh, folks want to make some comments? If not, I'll move item 68. <laughs> Second. Oh, Joe, you wait. Uh, Taylor Weber, Ward 3. Um, so the, uh, the listening sessions, the Q&As, those were awesome. But what's weird is participating in them felt like shouting into a void because I never heard any responses to any of the questions I'd asked. Uh, questions like, what was our pay disparity for firefighters as opposed to uh, police officers? Uh, what is the amount of money we spend each council meeting uh, keeping officers and SWAT team behind the scenes. Uh, again, just every question that was asked or I knew that was asked, uh, just never heard anything from. So the feedback aspect there, I don't think uh, really landed like you wanted to, or maybe it did, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think there's some real concerns in the budget as a whole. Again, we're still spending way too much uh, and calling it public safety when in reality it's militarizing our police department and continuing to enable that. Uh, we actually didn't fix stormwater problems in the area, like that's proved by all the recent storms recently. So a lot of the things we've been spending a bunch of money on as a city, we're not actually fixing and doing well. So we should do better. Yeah. Is he in pronouns and I live in Ward 3. Um, the budget has uh, far too much money for DMPD, especially considering their conduct over the past years, and especially the past few years. Um, and while the city held public input sessions, the public input they received is not reflected in the city's budget. Um, and as Taylor said, a lot of the questions were just never answered. Um, 
The city held a budget Q&A back in December, telling people who showed up that their feedback would be taken to council and considered for the budget, but that feedback was omitted from the city's official feedback report, and we requested it with FOIA requests, and it was denied by the city. They withheld it until we went to the I Iowa Public Information Board, and then after some arguments there, we finally got it, and it was added, but this was after the initial budget already came out. Um, and then the city, interestingly, um, decided to say that it was actually harmless that they admitted public feedback that was taken back in December until mid-February. Um, and I think it's really concerning that we're hearing about all these public input sessions, and I don't know about what happened in every single session, but the one session that I know about uh, very intimately, um, I just know that the feedback from that was actually not used in constructing this budget. And that really concerns me, especially because the city is... Next speaker. Hello, um, my name is Jolene Prescott. I live in Ward 2. And gee, didn't defund the police die at the last um, State of the Union message? Our president was quite clear. And so we still need to fund our police, and they still need to be able to do their job. Thank you. We've got a move in a second. I would like to just speak on some of the concerns that were brought up. I have similar concerns about how public input was used in constructing this budget. Um, I am going to go ahead and vote yes on the capital improvement um, program, so I'll be voting yes on this specific hearing. Um, but I, I agree, there wasn't the public input was not was not integrated in a way that was satisfactory. There was a request made back in December that um, we see a report of how public input was reflected in the budget, and I haven't seen that report. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, validate those concerns. I, I do believe that is something that we did not meet. Um, public expectation on. Joe? We vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes, motion carries. All right, moves us to 69, which is an amendment to the annual budget for the current fiscal year, which ends June 30 of 2022. Council communication number 22-126. Mr. Manager, did you want to make any comment on this or no, it let it go? Okay. We'll open it up um, for germane comments on the budget amendment. Still Taylor Weber? Still War 3? Yeah, so equally relevant, right? Still the budget. We're talking about amending it for the rest of this year. I think these concerns are equally valid, uh, especially as we're finally getting into some decent weather. Hopefully more people are out and about doing a lot more. Uh, I'd hate to see uh, the inability for us as a city uh, to allow public dissent like we have over the past several years. That includes increasing funding uh, that we have on an item tonight uh, for infrared funding for DMPD that we're spending half a million dollars on. Uh, and again, just where are our priorities as a city? I think uh, last year's budget didn't reflect it. Since it's been amended, it hasn't reflected what we claim our priorities to be. And as the last item was voted on, clearly don't really take the public into input into consideration anyways. But I think it's just valid to keep pointing out that uh, what our budget actually uh, prioritizes is not what many on the council claim to be priorities uh, of them. We have a motion. I'll move item 69. I'll second. Mm -hmm. A vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, six yes. Motion carries. 
Item 70 is on the proposed budget for the fiscal year ending June 30 of 2023. Council communication number 22-126. Mr. Manager, anything on this or open it up? Open it up. Okay. We'll ask if there's anyone would like to make comment on item 70, the fiscal year budget 2023. Hello, my name is Adam Callanan. He and pronouns word three, five foot three or nine. Um, so earlier I talked about with the public input how a lot of that public input didn't actually seem to come back to council in any meaningful way. Um, I wanted to talk about as well with this budget what was taken into consideration um, in the meantime because there is kind of a double standard there. Uh, we know from other meetings that just a phone call from businesses like Captain Roy's gets a direct line to the council for revisiting budget things like the Birdland Marina. And I just think that's really concerning that the city is kind of putting on a show having these budget listening posts. But then what we see actually is taken back and considered for reworking the budget are things like uh, development projects like the Birdland Marina. Again, it was in a council meeting that we were told that just somebody called them, like a business owner called them from Captain Roy's. Um, and I just think that um, there's a great double standard that we've also seen here today in speaking times where developers are allowed to answer questions, but residents aren't. Um, it's just everywhere across these meetings and across the city's priorities. I got a babysitter for this, so we're good. Uh, yeah, so one number that really stuck out to me is I, I looked at this and it's across the other ones as well. But I didn't, I didn't really realize that our operating budget is just over like a billion dollars. The city our size, like that's a lot of money, right? That's a ton of money. You could afford that house that that guy wants to build uh, if, if you had that much money. I digress. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, again, this, this budget does not reflect your stated, Josh and Connie, your stated campaign uh, promises, objectives, things you said in the community and said you, where your priorities were on things like public safety. You said you wanted an independent investigation into DMPD uh, based on their recent actions, allegations and issues, not only in the community but internally themselves. Yeah. Where is that reflected in this budget? Where is the change in accountability reflected on items that you spoke to your friends and neighbors about, about why you wanted to represent them here? I heard you talk for 20 minutes for a de developer that wanted to not make money. Yeah. See this. Yeah. yeah. Right. You said, I'm saying <laughs> So I would just like to say, if we're done with public comment, on since we're talking about the um, operating budget at this point, uh, I came onto this council saying that I wanted to defund the police, saying that I wanted to find alternatives for public safety, saying that I wanted to redirect some of that money into preventative measures that create a better uh, living situation for many, many people, which would be improving public safety. Um, I didn't have any you know, uh, notion that the rest of the council was going to do a big cut to DMPD this year. Uh, and so I believe I made a very reasonable um, you know, compromise on that point and requested no increase in funding for DMPD um, in the current budget. I was told that I was asking for too much, um, just asking for that small piece. And um, I do not believe that I'm asking for perfection uh, in saying that I'm going to vote no on any budget that increases DMPD's funding. Um, I would vote yes on this budget if it stayed flat. I think that at this point, when we are in, in a different political political space than we were in, when we've heard roughly two years of, of you know, demands and activism and, and the public speaking out, saying that something needs to be done, the fact that we're doing nothing is just not acceptable to me. And so I have to vote no on this budget because that was not reflected. We have a motion? I'll move item 70. I'll second. Joe? I'll vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's six yes, one no. Motion carries. Thank you, Thank you. I voted for you. Item 71, which is on the Des Moines levy alterations, phase B, resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, and receive and file bids. Council communication number 22-134. Uh, we'll ask the general public um, to 
speak uh, only to the plan specifications, form of the documents, the engineer's estimate, or the low bidder designation, and we will allow anyone who would like to speak regarding this levy um, a minute to speak. I will move item 71. Oh. You all right? It's not on? There it is. There it is. Uh, Taylor Weber, Ward 3, for the record. Um, yeah, this project, really big, really big number here, too, like almost $13 million. Again, I think it's just good to be aware of the type of money we're spending on projects. Uh, uh, again, the b bids, we only got three bids uh, on this project as well. Uh, we had a history of uh, overpaying for projects in, in recent uh, history, so it's good to see that this isn't drastically over uh, estimate. Uh, it's good that that's improved. Uh, the, one, the one piece I would say, the, the goal here is, again, flood mitigation improvements. Again, I thought that's what we did on Fleur. I thought that's what we've done in these areas that we say we've solved. Uh, stormwater management and, and the like, and we have not. Uh, all you have to do is search social media and you'll see videos from all throughout the winter and the storms we've had that clearly show what we thought was good enough wasn't in those areas. So I would really make sure since the target of this project is flood mitigation, that we maybe reevaluate uh, the... Anyone else want to speak? We have a motion. I think I moved it. Second. Moved and seconded. Vote you? yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 72, which is on the Animal Control Facility bid package number two. Uh, this is the grading, utilities, public improvements, streets, uh, resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, and receive and file bids and designating the lowest responsive, responsible bidder as MPS Engineers, PC, DBA as Kingston Services PC, Umash Shiti, um, President, $1,194,500, Council Communication Number 22-131, a is the approval of the contract and bond and permission to sud blet. I'm going to ask the manager quickly. Uh, we've got a number of pieces here um, going towards the animal control. And uh, uh, could you quickly explain why we're splitting it up and uh, what we hope to accomplish here? Sure, uh, Mayor and Council members, members of the public. Uh, this is a different bidding process that we have engaged in with the animal control facility in that instead of hiring a general contractor with one bid for all packages, this is a uh, opportunity to use a construction manager that is helping us put together each of the, what typically would have been a subcontract uh, into a package that each of the services are directly contracted with the city. And so you're gonna see about a dozen of these uh, over the next couple of meetings. All right, this uh, first piece is the animal uh, control bid package. As I say, it's the degrading the utilities, the public improvements, the streets, resolution, um, the engineer's estimate, receive and file the bids, and we um, show the lowest uh, bidder. And of course, A under that is approved with the contract and bond and permission to sublet. We'll ask if there's anyone who would like to speak on this animal control. Before we do that, I have a question. I know that we are bidding these separately, but it, I believe there is a rule that allows us to move multiple items. Would we be able to consider 72 through 80 together um, along with, you know, the combined public comment if there is any? Well, they're all separate bidders. Yes, but that's what I'm wondering is if we're able to uh, make a motion to vote on all of them together or not. Um, well, the problem is that each one is a separate hearing, and so then each hearing has to be closed. Um, I suppose theoretically you could could do that, um, but you're going to have to go through each item separately. The the idea, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea 
in the rules is to, to kind of speed it up so that you don't have to do that, but you, you, you can't speed it up. You have to have each one separately considered with a separate hearing opportunity. So it doesn't make a difference either way. Yeah, I mean, you could get to the end if they just have one vote, but you're going to be... It, yeah. It, that's we still got to read them all. <laughs> yeah, okay. Read them all. All move 72 items. and 72A. I think we still had to, we didn't really get to the public comment. I kind of interrupted before we got right. there. Any uh, public comment regarding the plan specifications form, the documents, or okay. the bidder? All right. I'm sorry, who was the second? Was there a second? Ward 3. Um, yeah, I, I think pointing out, uh, I appreciate the explanation for why this is so, so different uh, than, than other times. Seems like a good thing, maybe more in control of each bid. Uh, Price-wise, as we go through, especially as been stated, the construction price is rising. I will note, uh, as package as a whole, I think we're like 15 million or somewhere around there, if I add it up right. Uh, and this all rolls up to the DMPD uh, as part of the budget. So, again, increasing this funding. Uh, I wonder if the uh, establishment of the facility is the most important thing for animal control, or if maybe paying more uh, to animal control employees and wages having more of them, making sure they're more prepared to handle situations uh, that they might encounter in the community or more fully staff them so we don't have to have police officers respond to animal related incidents uh, when there aren't enough staff there. So again, uh, get ready. I'm going to come up here every time and say germane shit about this rolling up the DMPD. Uh, but I really don't think that all this money is the best use of the money to serve the city. Okay, we have a motion. And who's the second? I'll second item 72 and 72A. I will say I don't think we need police officers on animal control. Um, just want to agree with that. Joe? No vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 73 is the animal control facility bid package number four. This is the concrete building foundations and slab on grade. A resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, receive and file bids, and designating the lowest responsive responsible bidder is Jensen Builders Limited. Dale H. Jensen is the president, $631,300. Uh, Council communication number 22-145. And A, under that, is approval of the contract and bond and permission to sublet. We'll open it up and see if anyone from the general public wants to talk about the plans or the specifications or the bidder or the price or <coughs> Taylor Weber Board Three. Uh yeah, I appreciate the, the acknowledgement. Uh actually had an issue where called for animal control because there was a bat in my house and wanted to take it out nicely. Uh but it was like twelve feet in the air and I couldn't get it, not quite that tall. And so uh, animal control couldn't come, so a cop showed up with a Tupperware container, and she said, my bad. Uh, so I paid some homeboy next door cash to get up on a ladder and go get it. Uh, so again, I would really uh, say that now over half a million for the next piece of this project, and we're going to continue to approve large sums of money. Is that the thing that's going to improve animal control in the city? Uh, and will the money being spent here, again, close to $15 million, uh, prevent police coming into people's homes for things like mats, or rats, vermin, uh, other things that should be handled by, you know, a trained professional in that case. We'll ask if anybody else has any uh, uh, comments about the plan specifications, form of the documents, and engineer's estimate. Could we have a motion? Your Honor, I'm 73A. I'll second. So moved and seconded. Ask everyone to vote. I'll vote yes. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 74, the Animal Control Facility Bid Package Number 5. This is masonry. The resolution proving the plan specifications, form of contract documents, the engineer's estimate, receive and file the bids, and designating the lowest responsive responsible bidder is Seedorf Masonry, Inc. Mark Goodsko, $634,000. $740, Council Communication Number 22-132. Uh, A is approval of the contract and the bond. 
And again, these are uh, comments only specific to the plans, the specifications, form of documents, and engineer's estimate, and the low bidder. Total Weber, War Three. Uh, sorry, you didn't like my bat story. Um, I thought it was relevant. Maybe not. Uh, again, six hundred thirty-four thousand dollars in this case. Uh, I appreciate us again breaking this up, trying to make it more manageable. I haven't seen that this is affordable uh, for what we're spending the money on. Again, how much uh, is this a percentage of our budget, this whole project, and it rolls up to DMPD, uh, that it simply could go to something that would better serve the community. Uh, again, you decided to put all these items on here, and I'm sorry if you don't like me talking about them, but I'm going to keep coming up and bringing up, again, how much money we're spending on public safety uh, opposed to paying our employees a living wage or making sure they're adequately equipped. Uh, Do you want to talk about the low bidder, the designation? You need to stay to the subject. Thank you. I, start, I started with it. Not bad. I'll move 74 and 74A, Your Honor. This is Jolene Prescott. I live in Ward 1 or Ward 2. And one time we had an obviously rabid cat underneath our car. And the police came and shot it. And I was so glad Jolene, that we we're had that taken make care of. Comments well, to we plan. can talk about the no, police. No, no, Jolene, please. Does anybody else have any comments to make regarding the specifications, the form of the documents, the engineer's estimate, or the low bidder? Seeing none, can we have motion. a motion? I'll, I'll move 74. Uh, and 74A. I'll second 74 and 74 Since this hasn't been addressed and it has been brought up, I will say um, the funding source for these is general obligation bonds, a private grant, and the road use tax. I just wanted to be clear about that since it hadn't been addressed. It's been moved and seconded. Oh, yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Number 75, it's the Animal Control Facility Bid Package Number 7. This is the roofing and the sheet metal resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, receive and file bids, and designating the lowest responsive responsible bidder is Academy Roofing and Sheet Metal of the Midwest. Doing business is Academy Roofing and Sheet Metal Company. Brian Crum is the president, $323,600. Council communication number 22-133. Again, would anybody want to make any comments regarding the plan specifications, form of the documents, and the engineer's estimate in the low bidder designation? Do we have a motion? I'll move 75 and 75A. I'll second 75 and 75A. A was to approve the contract and the bond. Oh, yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. 76, Animal Control Facility Bid Package Number 9, Drywall Framing, Acoustic Ceiling, and Painting. Resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, receive and file bids, and designating the lowest responsive responsible bidder as First Interiors, Inc. Jeffrey Dunn is the president, $1,135,000. Council communication number 22-144A is approval of the contract and bond and permission to sublet. Again, anyone uh, have any comments regarding the plan specifications, form of uh, documents, engineer's estimate of the low bidder? Yes. Kevin Hilton, um, I am in Ward 3, and uh, I'm with Carpenters, Local 106. I just want to uh, actually uh, make a statement prior to getting into the selection of this contractor is that construction is jobs. And um, the selection of contractors is important because in this case, we'd like to commend city council and the city for this uh, process in selecting a contractor that is providing uh, apprenticeship opportunities, career opportunities for people in the community. This is a, a good example of where this process actually did work. Going forward, I hope that the city will take a look at um, making certain that there aren't uh, poor, uh, you, uh, you know, um, 
<laughs> for, for practices on the construction sites through the selection of their contractors that may go through, you know, subcontracting uh, and, and uh, layers of subs where there's opportunity for um, Any other comment? Yeah. Taylor Weber? No, no. Yeah. Yeah, no, there. Taylor Weber, Ward 3. Um, yeah, uh, awesome that this, this company is really helping like build skills. I think that's hugely important. Uh, one thing that I, I might want to point out then is that this project is for $1.1 million and the city's estimate is $490,000. Uh, so it's over twice the amount that we're saying we're estimating. So Again, we went through this a bit ago when bidding was a lot tougher at the beginning of the year. Uh, but is this uh, estimating issue that we need to adjust that if we want to have companies that are doing this sort of thing, sometimes you pay more uh, for that sort of quality labor, quality construction. Is that the case? I don't know. I can't tell based on what we've been provided. But again, I would be hesitant to overspend uh, this drastically based on the city's estimates uh, for this year. So I think, again, evaluating our estimation process and uh, if we can make sure that's more in line with what our goals are. I'll say I'm happy to um, see that our that the lowest responsible bidder was um, a company that is providing apprenticeships. So I'm happy to hear that. Um, it was just the lowest one, so we're not um, spending like extra to to have something like that. However, I would be um, open to being a little bit more specific in the ways that we can, and I would still like to. Um, explore those possibilities. Um, but for now, I'll move 76A. 76, 76A? Is it two separate pieces, technically? 76 and 76A. Perfect. Second the motion. And moved and seconded. Oh, yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 77, the Animal Control Facility Bid Package Number 14, Mechanical. Resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, receive and file bids, and designating the lowest responsive responsible bidder is A.J. Allen Mechanical Contractors, Inc. Mark W. Allen is the president. $3,539,973. Council communication number 22-118. A. Approval of the contract and bond and permission to sublet. Again. Uh, we'll ask for any germane comments, and I see the gentleman yeah. up here now. Kevin, Kevin Hilton with Carpenters Local 106. Um, so just speaking in, in um, selection of the contractors through this process, I would also like to add that going forward, uh, verification of payroll will be a good way, a good practice of the city to make certain and, and that there, are, there, there is not tax fraud on these jobs where people are being paid in cash and worker workers being exploited, so that's something to think about. And Mr. Mayor, I did um, add some verbiage a couple of meetings ago at the suggestion of Jeff. Was that language able to be put into any of these, or was that just for private contracts? That, that was for, for the private Just contract. for private, we can't, okay. Well, I mean, there, there, there's a limitation, you can't do it now. Um, because these, these are already done and out right. and bid. But, but I had but asked for it even I, before. I, and I don't know where that, that's for Scott to, to... These were already on the street at that point, as I understand yeah. it. So yeah. we'll be because forward. I've been asking for that for quite some time. Mm -hmm. right. We can add that. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's being worked. We provided the, the language. Okay. So. so we're working on it yes, to get something put in. Yes, ma'am. Well, will our project manager, uh, are they able to uh, do that, Scott? I didn't catch that question. Will the project manager be able to do that? Uh, not require it. They, they, they could ask. Sure. The request could be made, but it could not be required. I think we need to request White to do all of that. They're the ones that are ultimately in, in, in charge of the project, and so I think that they need to do that. I would I would agree with that. It, and and we've and, asked for this for a long time. Okay. Sure. Taylor 
Lord Weber, Ward 3. Uh, yeah, I'm in agreement with all you. I obviously always am. Uh, you, Linda, to your credit, I remember when you brought this up on this item, uh, when this whole bidding process was coming across, it brought up that we should have it for verifiable uh, income. So it is sad that we as a city, like, we have a priority here to do it, and we're still failing to do it on something that's so important as paying people uh, the amount of money that it costs to live here, uh, especially if you think $450,000 is middle housing. Uh, I think that's really uh, shows your priorities. Again, this item, back to the bidding, because that's what's germane, uh, we're $600,000 over cost here as well, or at least by a city estimate. Again, so like when you add all these up, how much overestimate are we on the project as a whole? Uh, it's kind of kind of getting ridiculous. Uh, you'd go upside down if you were a business at this point, but yeah. We have a motion. I, before we do that, I would just like to question um, that we are not able to require, it, we're talking about um, payroll verification, right? That we're not able to require payroll verification? That's what we're, that's what the conversation has been? Yes? There, there, there was, there was, thank you. My, my understanding from Scott is that, there, that these were out before that language was put in. It's not a requirement because the state specifies it, it would require a legislative change for it to be a requirement. The state specifies what we can ask. Yeah. Right. I, so for these, because they were already out, but in the future also no, because of well, we, the statute. We, we can put in the language about that we, we may request that information from them, yes. And we can put that in. Okay. Um, but as far as uh, disqualifying a bidder based on that, that's not one of the criteria that the state um, <laughs> allows us to inquire. Um, I guess I had asked about this um, last month, uh, about a month ago, um, and just the state's requirements. Bidders experience number of employees and an ability to finance the cost of the public improvement. Does that not, not, does that not fall under ability to finance the cost of the public improvement? Uh, Do we, we, don't, we don't think the case law would support that. Well, okay. I'm happy to visit with you on okay. that more. I didn't know if we needed like, to explore that or if it had been explored. It's been explored. Okay. But we're happy to visit with you more and go through that with you. Sounds good. I would just like us to look at that because I know I have sent out the Omaha ordinance and I was told Omaha, Nebraska does things different than Iowa does, but that we could work on getting some sort of verbiage. I believe I sent you some verbiage and, and you gave me suggestions at one of the council meetings several months ago. So I think it's really important that we get that language in there. I think that's being worked on. Okay. Linda, can you send me that Omaha ordinance? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a motion. And Scott, going forward, you're going to have a conversation with the project and project manager to ultimately look at, look at this for this project, correct? As I understand it, the council wants us to request it, yes. We okay. Just can't require Perfect. It, right? okay. I'll move 7778. Second. Second already. Been moved and seconded. I vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 78, Animal Control Facility Bid Package Number 15. This is electrical. Resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, receive and file bids, and designating the lowest responsive responsible bidder is Van Manen Electric Inc. Nathan S. Van Manen is the president. $949,700. Council Communication Number 22-120A is approval of the contract and bond and permission to sublet. Again, we'll ask uh, if anyone in the public would like to make uh, any comments regarding the plan specifications form of those documents, engineers, estimate, or the low bidder. So you know, I'll move 78 and 78A. I'll second it. Been moved and seconded. I'll vote yes. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 79 is the Animal Control Facility Bid Package Number 16, Site Paving. 
resolution approving plan specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, receive and file bids, and designating the lowest responsive responsible bidder as Jensen Builders Limited. Dale H. Jensen is the president, $227,700. Council communication number 22-129A is the approval of the contract and bond and permission to sublet. Again, we'll open it up and see if anybody has any germane comments. With none, I would move 79 and 79A. I'll second. Uh, I have a quick question. Just uh, with the intention of splitting up the bid packages is to bid them all separately, but uh, it isn't necessarily to have separate um, companies on each of them? Because I, I, this is just a, we've had two uh, that are Jensen now. They're allowed to to uh, bid on more than one package. If that's the question. Uh, not 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 necessarily allowed. I guess what our intention is. Like if I got uh, yeah. this is only two, so it's not like right. The intention is to get the package and the work done under each package bid out separately, and okay. so regardless if the same individual, same company happens to vote or to bid on the same. Okay. The vote yes, Your Honor. Connie? Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Item 80. Again, it's on the Animal Control Facility bid package number 17. This one is landscaping resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, receive and file bids, and designating the lowest responsive responsible bidder is Alpha Landscapes, LLC. Riley Marvin is the owner, $145,950. Council communication number 22-130. A is approving the contract and the bond. And again, we'll open it up for Jermaine. Comments on the plans, specifications, form of documents, engineer's estimate, and a little better. Could we have a motion? Um, um, Move. I'll move 80 and 80A. I'll second. Been moved and seconded. Vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. 81 is dismissing the hearing on the approval of plan specifications, form of contract, and engineer's estimate on the animal control facility bid packages numbered 36. 8, 10, 11, 12, and 13 due to no bids having been received. Council communication number 22-119. A under that is ordering the construction of the following. The animal control facility bid package number 3, general carpentry. Number 6, architectural millwork. Number 8, glazing and metal panels. Number 10, Number 11, fluid applied flooring, received bids 426.22 and setting date of hearing 59 of 22. The engineer's estimate for all those packages is $1,480,000. Two, uh, Mr., are we going to vote on these separately or together? All right. Two is the animal control facility bid package number 12, which is the kennels and the cat cages, receiving bids of April 26 of 22 and setting the date of hearing of May 9th of 22. The engineer's estimate is $450,000. Council communication number 22-146. And three is the animal control facility bid package number 13, fire suppression, receiving of bids April 5th and setting date of hearing of May 9th. Engineer's estimate on that is $100,000. Council communication number 22-146. And on these, we're dismissing those hearings, so there's no public comment. Could we get a motion? I'll move, I'll move 81A. One, two, and three. I'll second. Been moved and seconded. And I will vote yes, Your Honor. 
Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Staff can speak with the mayor if he's asking about the Do you have a question? I just ask, uh, I have a job that I can't get off at 5 o'clock. I, I did carry a pocket knife in here. I had to go back in my car. I'm on item 61, 1100 Army Post Road. And if I could just have a chance to speak, I would greatly appreciate it. Council, item 61 is, uh, you recall, was the request uh, to amend plan DSM creating our tomorrow future land use designation for property located at 1100 Army Post Road from community mixed use to allow rezoning from RX1 mixed use district to I1 industrial district to allow for outdoor storage. Uh, the council voted 7-0 to deny um, voicing major concern about that kind of a use along that street. Are you would Mark? anybody want to move to um, reopen that hearing? I would move to reopen just especially given that when we opened the hearing we were specifically looking for the applicant. Um, so I would like to hear from the applicant. I would second. Okay. Thank you guys. Been moved and seconded. We have to vote on it first, sorry. <laughs> Joe? Yes, Your Honor. All right. We're going to reopen um, item 61 and ask our requester. You're Mark, right? I am. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for everything. I, I haven't been to the city council in a long time. I don't realize which side of the line you're on. This is a thankless job. I, I really get it by coming down here. I've owned the business, I've owned that building for over seven years. I haven't changed a single thing. I bought it, it's a seven car garage and a little office about the size of a bathroom. I use it for storage, some stuff inside, some stuff outside. It's got a six foot fence with bob wire on the top. I, uh, two years ago they came by and wanted to do a sidewalk through there. I don't understand why I'm even here, but uh, I was all about putting the sidewalk in, let them put the sidewalk in and everything else. I know my trailer was there when we zoned it. They poured the approach for the outside storage. The city did, paid for that. Who was the inspectors there? When was it there? I haven't changed a single thing and won't want to change it. They want to make it sound like I want to be a factory there. I'm not changing anything else. I just want to be able to keep my outside storage and a trailer there. That's all I've ever asked. That's all I've ever done. I thought I had permission because I got a six foot fence and bob wire. Uh, I've talked to them about trying to uh, redo some stuff as far as like changing the fence to like a closed in like a wooden fence or something but the problem is is it's a really narrow lot if you look at it and it's it's small and there's not a lot of exterior space mm -hmm. so I mean it, it's it's just very difficult would I would you, talk to all the neighbors around there all the business people the landlords the tenants Everybody, I even got packets. I went door to door, talked to everybody. I got over 37 of them, I think. Um, nobody cares. They all looked at me like, why are we even here? Or I didn't even know that you had it there. I mean, I've talked two blocks around in every which direction. I want to talk to the people that live there, work there, and drive by there. Nobody cares. Nobody even notices it. I'm not wanting to change anything. I don't know what I need to do, but logistics, I don't keep my stuff out there any more than I have to. But at some times I do keep a trailer there for a day or two. I don't like to keep it in there, but that's all I want is a trailer and some outside storage. And I'm willing to do whatever it wants, but every time it, I just get boxed in and like, I can't do this, I can't do that. And they make it sound like, and like I said, the city came by and did the, they inspected it, so I'm just. I, I would suggest um, that probably your best avenue with the denial here would be go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. And then, because I think the fear here is that somebody, if the zoning was changed, would open it up to somebody not having a purpose such but as yours to doing something else. Can you not make it so that it's, it, whatever is, I can have these with that? Well, and, and, and I think I you'd make it, that appeal. No we've, had a, we've got a member here that served a significant number of years on the Zoning Board of Adjustment. And I think that really is the appropriate place to do this, 
not to have permanent zoning, but to allow you to do whatever it is that you're doing uh, that sounds like you've gotten some acceptance by the neighbors. I think the long-term fear is that the changing of the zoning all of a sudden opens it up to who knows what. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It was someone in the audience. I mean, even the church next door doesn't care. The neighborhood association doesn't care. I mean, I was there with you at there, and we talked about it. I mean, they they said no no problems. This is the neighborhood association. Didn't care about that at all. And the church, I went to the church. I talked to them. They, I, it's in here. I have it. Uh, no, I understand. Okay, thank We're you. We're just trying to give you the right avenue uh, to. And, and I get that I do, and that's part of the codes. I don't know what that means or this means. Yeah. Like I told Sue Ann, I, I sleep well at night. I don't need to read the city code. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> can we just direct city city sure. staff to to reach out to him and work with him to go through board of adjustment? Absolutely. So if we're reopening this item, is that reopening the hearing and reopening public comment all over again and everything? I'm sorry? Like, do we need to go through the, in the public comment process again before we discuss it and the, vote on it again? The, the council reopened it, so yeah, there would be it's an opportunity open. for another five minutes of, okay. of uh, or seven minutes of public comment. So I just wanted to open, I just wanted to wait and see if there was any more public comment right. before Thank you guys for what you this. do, because mm -hmm. it is a thankless job. <laughs> so, We've allowed the uh, party in the interest to, to speak and make his case. Is there anyone who would like to step up to the microphone uh, from the general public uh, and make germane comments regarding Ms. Zoni? Brad Weisemeyer, Ward 3. Uh, I just want to, uh, first off, thanks for coming in being able to speak up for yourself. I appreciate being able to advocate for yourself. Um, council, you make exceptions every meeting to Zoning and Boarding Commission's declarations or findings or whatever. Um, seems like a perfect opportunity to be able to do that for somebody who's here, who means well clearly, obviously has the buy-in from the community. Uh, instead of doing that for like random property developers all the time, this seems like a very perfect opportunity to be able to just grant an exception for once. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say. Got you, George. Uh, Taylor Weber, still Ward 3. Uh, appreciate opening this. I was stuck in the overflow uh, for this one. Wasn't able to come in until 62, which, interesting, I'm not sure why we still have overflow with limited seating, because there's no mass mandates anymore, but I don't know, it seems silly. Uh, yeah, it's, it's super interesting to see who you uh, vote with and vote against the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, earlier, again, this uh, developer that we said has gone through this rigorous process the public's vehemently against, and you go against planning and zoning, the, the areas that you're directing people to go to. Uh, so is that really helpful, or are you just pushing off the problem? Again, he's been running his business uh, as, as it sits here. You tried to put uh, industrial chemicals uh, last meeting with all these exceptions for, hey, you have to do it just this way. I don't see why we can't make similar accommodations for businesses that are already in the area. Uh, yeah, I just think you should be consistent maybe. I don't know. So if there's no more public comment, I, I guess the, this is my concern is just that we're going to run into a situation where somebody who's had a, had the situation they've been with for seven years, you said you've had this building for seven years, um, nobody has an issue with anything that's going on. It, there's hardly anything that like, you know, justifies the need for an industrial zoning. Um, and if we are able to, again, like we did with 62, go back and um, create conditions that are acceptable to the city and the, owner, and the owners, um, I just want to make sure that we're not putting somebody in a situation that just doesn't make any sense to put them in. I also, I, I also understand the point of like, it doesn't make sense to zone industrial here. I just don't want to put someone in a situation where we're like, sorry, this thing that you've been doing for seven years and that nobody cares about is going to be denied. And my concern comes from um, the uh, summary of the discussion at the planning and zoning meeting. Judy Parks crew stated a use variance is almost never allowed due to the stipulations set by state and city code, the zoning board of adjustment. Um, must find a piece of land that could not be used for anything else. Um, and so this is why we need to deny the rezoning, but I'm just, 
that raises the concern to me that the use variance wouldn't be allowed at the Zoning Board of Adjustment. And if I'm wrong on that, please clarify, because if going through the Zoning Board of Adjustment and getting the use variance and, you know, would just completely solve the situation, then that's all that I want, but I'm just worried that it wouldn't. Uh, yeah, sure. I sat on Board of Adjustment for many years. If we, if we allowed this applicant to change the zoning from mixed use to industrial, then we run into a completely different use. He could then sell that property. You could have somebody uh, move in, you know, industrial, and you have all kinds of outside storage. It's completely different, and that's on a, on a corridor. That's not what we have designed for that. If he would go to Board of Adjustment, they're very reasonable. He can take his petitions, grab some neighbors, have them go with you to support you, and then he would be given, I don't know if it would be in a variance or an exception, but it would be for him only, as long mm -hmm. as he owns that property. He would be able to keep his storage or whatever conditions that they would put on, but they're very reasonable. And for his specific use. Yes. Yeah, so, so, but we're not able to put those conditions on as a zoning no, condition. No, because he's before us to change the zoning. That's not what Board of Adjustment would do. His zoning would still be RX1. They would just give him an exception or a variance to be able to use his property for what he's been using it for for the last seven years. That's not something we can do here. That's not on the agenda. Right, I guess that, that's not within the conditions that we can, we can apply to this no, if we were to send no. it back. Okay. We can send, a, I think, a recommendation along with this that they ought to, for these purposes, and allow him to speak openly. Yeah. And okay. Yes, I you have. Can, you can tell him that, but Board of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial yes. board, so they make the determination. From there, it would go to district court. It doesn't come back to us. So if, if he is denied a use variance or an exception at the Zoning Board of Adjustment, what happens then? It's, it's just that sucks and you have to never have a trailer outside again? I, I can't answer for, for Board of Adjustment, but yes, if he were denied, I suppose that is the case. But he's got lots of information there, and it's a very reasonable board. They're made up of boards that made up of people that we have appointed, that we've put our trust in, that they will make reasonable decisions. He's been that way for seven years. It would be, if I was sitting on Board of Adjustment, I would say, look, let him, let him still do it. Okay, I hope that is the case. Um, I remember maybe a year and a half ago, a similar um, request was made that was denied at the Zoning Board of Adjustment. So I guess that's, again, where my concern, it's, was a while ago, so I couldn't point to the date to you, but like it was a while, like I, that's where my concern lies, I guess, is just that like the process, I guess, is what I was asking about. If we say deny here, then it can go to Zoning Board of Adjustment. If they say no, there's no other options, right? Just, just, yeah, district, district court. court. Well, district we, court. You can take it to district this. court. Well, that could always happen too. Okay, I, I would go to Board of Adjustment. I would like to, I would like to, recommend that we that we, we send along that recommendation that the mayor suggested i don't um, think we can have any contact with them well you can't uh, we can't make we could ask they, they are quasi judicial board that means that that it's improper for council to yeah. contact them directly yeah. and have any kind of ex parte communication on any item that's before them on the other hand there's nothing that would prohibit council from saying um that uh that the, the council understands uh, his his situation doesn't want to do the zoning, but is recommending that he go to Board of Adjustment. Um, but that would be about as far as, as you can go. Because and there's no staff recommendation there either, either. I'm sorry? There's no staff recommendation there either. Yeah, staff would make sure, recommendations. Sure, staff would make a recommendation. Sure. Okay. And the ward council person could, could, uh, could. Yeah, I'm happy to move again, alternative A with a recommendation uh, that this go to Zoning Board of Adjustment. Uh, and I don't, is there additional language that we can, we can add? Um, council recommends this go to B Zoning Board of Adjustment, uh, and we understand that 
based on what has been presented to us, there was no objection from neighbors or the neighborhood association and encourage zoning board of adjustment to take that into consideration as they make it. I don't know that I would, <laughs> I don't know that I would say encourage because then you're starting to, these are people that you appoint, they, they're separate quasi judicial okay. boards. So I, I think I'd stop short of that, but I think everything else you said would be fine to, I, to apprise some of that information. Are we able to, I guess my question was, are we able to direct staff to make a recommendation? They will. Right, the staff will make a recommendation, but are, like, there's all, all the time we're like, oh, we direct staff to do this and that and the other thing. Like, the the council's intent's pretty clear tonight. So. Okay, great. <laughs> They're listening. So encourage is taken out as per recommendation of the city attorney, but the rest of the, I think you you've got the intent. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Right. I'll second. I think we need a second. Need so a second. Oh, I'll second. Do Sorry. <laughs> A vote yes, Your Honor. All right. Seven yes, motion carried. Thanks for coming down. All right, we're going to now go back to uh, the consent um, item seven, Council Member Voss, um, which is a public improvement approving the professional services agreement with. Tool Design Group LLC for professional services to develop a Vision Zero citywide transportation safety plan not to exceed $223,445. Council communication number 22-112. Mr. Voss. Thank you, Mayor County. Um, I, I, I am really looking forward to uh, Tool's engagement with our city staff and uh, Members of the community, they uh, have experience developing Vision Z Zero plans through, through other communities. Um, so th they have a clear goal is to eliminate auto fatalities and serious injuries. So um, I, I believe most of the council members would agree with me that uh, the largest or the most frequent complaint that we hear from neighbors is that cars are, are going too fast in their neighborhood. And uh, to, w when TUA has uh, uh, developed these programs elsewhere, um, they, they often recommend reducing uh, speed limits in school zones to 15 or 20 miles an hour. Um, I think in the Twin Cities when they did this, they were at uh, 20 miles an hour in residential streets. Um, part of the plan that they'll do will be uh, improving pedestrian crossings, uh, particularly in downtown and school zones. I, I think some of you are familiar with what are called continental crossings. Some people call it zebra crossings or Abbey Road crossings. Um, so I would uh, uh, expect that that might be part of their plan and uh, they will have multi-year priorities. And with that, I'd like to move um, item seven. I'll second. All right, been moved and seconded. Vote yes, Your Honor. All righty. Your Honor, that's seven yes, motion carried. We'll move to item 15, which is land property transaction um, regarding a request from Capital City Real Estate, Inc. Bruce Philman is the officer for a review and approval of the preliminary plat, Philman subdivision preliminary plat on property in the vicinity of 1415 East 38th Street for development of six one-household residential lots. Councilmember Westergaard. Thank you. I. You know, this was on the consent agenda. I pulled it. I just cannot put any kind of approval on this preliminary plat. What's interesting to me that this is in the Grays Woods neighborhood. And if, if any of you are familiar with Grays Woods, the properties, there's no sewer. They are on septic. There is water. There are no curbs. There are no gutters. There are um, not even 
cement roads like what we're used to or what we see in other parts of the city, full of trees, very large, large lots. I think the people that live there are very lucky. I think most of us would love to live in an area like this. It's quiet, it's, uh, you know, it's serene, it's like walking, it's like driving through a, a countryside. And what has happened is this person came in and wants to take two lot of records and put six houses there. And from what I've seen on the plans, he wants to put in a street with a cul-de-sac and put six houses around it. This does not fit with the neighborhood. It, there, are, there are not other homes anywhere near there that are like this. Um, I'm concerned about the stormwater. I'm concerned about the trees that have to be removed. They would be taking down quite a few trees. And we know that anytime you put cement in driveways, that water now has to go somewhere else. It looks to me from the terrain, it's gonna run right down into residents that are already there, that have invested in their property, that it will go right into their septic system. And I think that's a very real possibility. I, I went back and I watched the, I think it was the March, uh, March 15th plan and zoning meeting. And quite a few, it, it looked like there was quite a few neighbors who got up and spoke and there wasn't one person that was in favor of this. Now I realized there was not a neighborhood meeting because it was not required because it wasn't a change of zoning. But it's very clear that this is not an appropriate place to put six houses when everybody around it has their large, large uh, lots. And, you know, no sidewalks, no gutters, no storm sewers. It's a very different uh, feel than what you have if you were going to go out and put in a new development and put in a cul-de-sac and put six houses there. That's very different um, than, than what we have here. Um, the, it's not on a corridor. It's set back. You know, most people, you, you know, you could drive around Grace Woods and you're just going to see houses back behind the trees. Um, it's, it's in their plan. If you go back and you look at the neighborhood plan that the city the city put their stamp of approval on and it's published and it says they want to keep their larger lots and keep the, the, uh, keep the, the feel of the neighborhood that it is current. So for that, I'm going to vote no and I have asked my fellow council members to vote no. Uh, you want to go first? I, I go. No, go. I guess my thing is when we're talking about needing more housing, uh, this is an area and I, I know the area. I would only hope this would lead to better improvements of better roads, better sidewalks. And with the sewer retention they're talking about, I think unless we need Mike Legwood to come in, it sounds like the houses are gonna be comparable to the rest of the houses in that area. So from a standpoint, I appreciate that there's a lot of wooded area and there's a lot of need. We need to get these houses probably off the septic and that's what we heard about this morning. That I think that this, when you look at the amount of land we have versus six homes there, it gives us an opportunity to put more housing in an area that right now is just empty. So I would, I guess I can't support that. Uh, I think that and the aspect of that neighborhood, I think we can put housing and do it well, because I, it is wooded. I mean, it's a great area, it's, but there's a lot of amenities that need to be done in that area, and this could hopefully lead to some of that because it's done about a block down where they put newer homes. So. But it's not in any plan. It wasn't in the plan this well, morning. It's already zoned, though. We, we have so much vacant land, and, you know, not to bring up a subject, but 
we wanted to put this same type of development out on Northeast 46th, and most of you here voted no and said, no, that's not appropriate. And that would have been, you know, that would have increased our tax base quite well, a bit. At this point, though, I guess I would move that we accept because this is to receive and file, and if Mike wants, to, if anybody else wants to talk, Mike, do you have a couple of comments you want to make? Only if you want me to answer any questions, <clears throat> Mayor. If I could, and not have Mike jump in, I think we need some clarity on process here because this is simply to receive and file, mm -hmm. and so even with we're, a we're looking for approval though, to receive well, and file. to receive and file, even with a no vote, where would this go, Mike? It, would it still even go with through? a no vote, the plat is approved already by the Plan and Zoning Commission. So the final plat would have to come to council at a later time. At that point, the council would have to make a decision of whether or not the final plat is consistent with the approved preliminary plat. And so then the council would have a chance to vote at that point. Um, there'd be a public hearing on that, that final plat at that point. And uh, the council could make a decision at that point. Thank you. I think it's a disservice to the neighborhood. I think to, I still stand with my move to receive and file it. So. I um, would like to speak on this as well, and I'm going to express a little bit of consistency here. Um, I was at the planning and zoning meeting where this was discussed, and I heard the neighborhood's, um, the neighborhood concerns. Again, or even more strongly, much more strongly, what I heard was, we need more density, we need more housing, but not here in my neighborhood. And I question where then? We need to increase our housing exponentially, and we are nowhere near that goal. We aren't even on track to towards that goal. I can't be in opposition to building housing, especially on an empty lot, and I understand the concerns that you have. I would like to see um, you know, the, the hookup to sewer, the, the improved uh, roads and sidewalks. Um, and I just want to acknowledge people in the audience, these are the exact same complaints that y'all brought up um, uh, at, at yours, and I. I have to say that I just have to approve building housing and I just want to respond to, to one comment. No one should be lucky to live in a certain neighborhood in our city. Everyone should have that opportunity. So I think that we do need to be developing more housing and we need to be developing that housing at different income levels so that we have that diversity in our neighborhoods and nobody gets to say I'm so lucky that I live on multiple acres in what's a growing city. So I have to be... Have you ever been to the neighborhood? I haven't. Personally, I haven't been to the neighborhood, but I would like to see more housing in our city. We have lots of places to put Where, housing. Linda? Well, we denied over on East 46 where a developer wanted to put the same type of thing, and the city said no because there was ingress and egress issues, and they wanted them to buy a lot that wasn't even for sale. And, uh, you know, I think that just died. We have lots of places to build housing. And everywhere that we go, there are going to be people saying, not in my neighborhood. That's not what this is about. This is a That's the only complaint that I heard at the planning and zoning meeting. No, that's That's not. the discussion that we're having. No. Go back and listen to it because I just watched it. And the concern was the groundwater that would be going into their septic systems. It would be concern about the... Uh, trees that are taken down. I mean, right now it's a very hilly terrain, and you get, you start putting cement and you start putting, putting houses and sidewalks. That water has to go somewhere. And Gray's Woods, we, we've we 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 have no plans. I was at a meeting where Scott addressed it. If these people wanted to put streets and storm sewers, they would be assessed for it. They would have to help pay for that because we don't do that. Then let's work on those plans. Let's, let's continue talking to Jonathan Gano about uh, maybe looking at this area if it wasn't considered in the plan that we saw from this morning. The residents w would be their responsibility to pay for it. Okay. So, so they, it is a very beautiful area. I will go ahead and make a motion for public comment as we got that request. Does anybody want a second? I'm going to support my neighborhoods. <laughs> Connie, did you get a second on your motion? I haven't got a second. I'll go ahead and second.
Okay, we've got a um, second on a motion regarding the request uh, for Capital City Real Estate Inc. for review and approval of preliminary plat for the Philman subdivision preliminary plat on 1415 East 38th Street for development of six one household residential lots. So if we vote no, would this come uh, because this is just a re request to the final plat will come to council and we'll vote we'll vote we to approve, to approve the final plat later so we um, how, how just I've got a question how large is the lot it's a total of both of them 1.74 1.74 4. so it'd all be of the how the lots are most of the lots in this net neighborhood are that size so we're changing the character of their neighborhood okay so at any rate that'd be over a quarter of an acre about for each one of these yeah. oh, lots for houses or homes or whatever we call them mm -hmm. do we know is he putting duplexes or I don't it was townhomes regardless we're so just receiving and filing out. right yeah just to, Mr. to clarify, the, the agenda item um, that was uh, on display for review and approval of the preliminary plat, that is, that is not correct. It, the actual roll call is a receive and file communication from PNZ regarding the preliminary plat, and then in the body of the resolution, um, the City Council uh, hereby receives and files the That's attached communication. That's not what I have. Was that a... This that, is, that's what the actual roll call is. Mike said so that we would be agenda, seeing a final plat. Item that, that, to the extent it says approval, that's incorrect. So they this do. is a receive and file? This is a basically guess, a receive and file. I guess, but nobody told me. That's not what it says here. That's, that's, that's not what yes, I'm. That's incorrect. Well, well so how can we vote on something that's incorrect? The, it, the approval, it's a scrivener's there. The approval shouldn't have been in there. I don't know why it's, it was in there, but it's a, if well, you look at the roll call right So there, we, what we want to say is have a motion to receive and file. Is that correct? Which is what Connie made. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I seconded so and we're voting. Receive and file. Yes. I guess, so. I guess some people get to know what's in, what's correct and others don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why the agenda is like that. We'll, Ma Mayor, Mayor, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm extremely confused, and I'm yeah. sorry that I'm not there. It probably doesn't make it easier. That, uh, but so we're voting to receive and file something that the Planning and Zoning Commission already approved. Correct. Okay, and then so if we vote to deny that, what does that mean? Then it well, what it really means is that eventually, uh, and Mike can sure come in and correct me, but I believe what it means is that eventually it will still come back to council for review of the final plat because the preliminary plat was approved by PNZ. Okay, so it, even if even if you know Linda decides to say, okay, I'm going to vote yes, we're all going to vote yes, we still get another look at it, and at that point in time, we can have a discussion of what it's going. We don't even know what it's. I don't even know what it's going to be built there. Yes, sir. Okay. For the final. So again, it's preliminary. Well, I mean, it's, fr it's frustrating that things, it is frustrating that things are on the agenda that that aren't uh, absolutely. And some of us know about it. Some of us don't. Oh, I don't know anything about that. But well, I'm looking at the agenda. And I know what it reads. It's the roll call that says what we're actually resolving to do. Okay. So the motion I believe is to receive and file the preliminary plat knowing that the final plat is going to have to come back uh, for final approval yes sir. okay Joe well I, I want to support what is I guess I need to know what the ward council person doing this I'm is, this voting is no, ward. Joe. the ward council person okay. is voting no and supporting the neighborhood all right I'll vote no <laughs> Your Honor, that's five yes, two no. Motion carries. All right. That goes to item 54. Item 54 is approving uh, a purchase of Software Inc. Edward A. Simons, President, for 49 
uh, night vision eyepieces with helmet mount and carrying case to be used by the statewide technical response weapons of mass destruction teams using grant award funds. Council communication number 22-108. All right, so um, it seems it seems, and it, I think it is, that every single council meeting I'm pulling off some item about police funding. Um, and I'm sure that I'm getting just as tired of that as the rest of you are. But it's indicative of the fact of how much we spend and how often we're spending on this police funding. Um, but specifically, I got a comment from uh, someone in the public who wanted me to read their comment on this. Um, I'm concerned about item 54 on the consent agenda for funding 49 night vision eyepieces to be used by the statewide tactical response teams, including 12 of them here in Des Moines. We do not need to be spending nearly half a million dollars on more and more paramilitary equipment for our police department. The DMPD has historically, and especially in recent months, chosen to raid the homes of community members and families in the middle of the night. Not only do these overly aggressive raids terrorize the communities where they occur, it is racially targeted at our black community members. Multiple council members stated their desire for independent investigation into the DMPD given their inability to actually serve the community or even protect their own employees from harassment. I have yet to see any item come before council that even approaches accountability for the DMPD, but yet again, we have hundreds of thousands for more equipment on the consent agenda. This type of equipment just further enables the terrorizing of our community and doesn't actually accomplish anything towards the public safety it claims to serve. So, and a little bit of a different um, situation than some of the other, um, you know, SWAT team, bomb squad, uh, weapons of mass destruction team um, items that we have had before when we were approving the um, bomb diffusing robots and all of the items that were associated with that. Those were necessary to get a certain like rating of um, bomb squad to get like a type one um, bomb squad, I believe that has the capability to, you know, uh, protect us from car bombs and things like this. This, I did not see anything that um, buying this equipment would grant us a certain, um, you know, grade of, of status for like, oh, we're meeting some expectations, we're meeting some requirements um, that are set by Homeland Security. I didn't see that. And the concern that was brought up in the public comment that I read is a serious concern to mine. I have, um, people that I know who have been traumatized pretty horribly by um, these police raids in the middle of the night um, that were completely unwarranted. And so I think that our continuous approval without question and without um, consideration and without any alternate action that is addressing these issues that have been brought up is irresponsible. And so I will be voting no on this. Mr. Manager, you want to make a comment? Yeah, just, just for... So if I could, um, Mayor, for clarification, the night vision goggles are also uh, utilized in uh, hostage situations when, when people have barricaded themselves into homes and whatnot. And we have had quite a few of those incidents, unfortunately, within the city. So uh, an important piece of equipment to have available to us. And this, again, is statewide. These funds would be for the team statewide as well. Do you know how many off the top of your head? No, but it's there's been quite a few. Second, Your Honor, I'll move item 54. Sorry, you missed it. Connie, Connie did it. Then I'll second it. Okay. Okay. And I'll vote yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's six yes, one no. Motion carries. All right. That now takes us to ordinances. First consideration. Uh, amending Chapter 114 of the Municipal Code regarding traffic regulation changes as follows. Council communication number 22-141. One forty one A is a proposed code change to allow additional on street parking on Walnut Street between Third Street and Fourth Street and to match field conditions. Somebody want to move that one? I'll move item eighty two and eighty two A.
second. It's been moved and seconded. Let's get everyone. Can we can we waive pursuant to Rule 42A the second and third reading, Your Honor? Yes. As part of the motion. Pursuant to Rule 42A, I'll move to waive the second and third reading. And I will vote yes. Been moved and seconded. We're going to move to our uh, public speaking items. Um, and for those persons wishing to, to speak this evening, uh, under the public speaking item on the agenda, we will only be calling on those who have registered to speak. All speakers must comply with the rules regarding their names and addresses or will not be recognized. Each of the 15 speakers this evening will receive up to two minutes each to make their comments. Please keep your own time because at the end of the two minutes, clerk will announce time and the speakers mic will be closed and we will move immediately to the next speaker. We want to hear from all of our residents and we encourage residents to be respectful of others' views that are different from their own. While you may certainly disagree with that viewpoint, I want to remind everyone that the council's rules provide that any comments that are slanderous will result in speaker being barred from further comment. As uh, the presiding officer, I will determine whether the comments are slanderous or not, but fair warning, arguing with uh, the presiding officer about the determinations uh, on any matter is not permitted and doing so will be considered disruptive and result from the uh, speaker being barred from further comment and being required to leave uh, the building. Uh, I would also like to say this evening um, we had some issues regarding people um, coming up or sp speaking too long. I will ask that uh, we will call the speaker's name and I want that person to come up and then they'll get their two minutes and then I would like that person to sit down or leave the microphone and then we'll call the next person. We're not going to let uh, somebody else just come up to the microphone uh, uh, even though it may be their turn. Uh, you, I'm going to ask that nobody come to the microphone until their name is called. So. That will be disruptive and be removed and asked to, to leave. Okay? So our first speaker is Denver Foote. Denver Foote, she, her pronouns, Ward 3, 50312. Um, I came here with uh, to talk about some specific remarks towards the Mid-American Franchise Agreement, but after sitting through a council Meeting, I am very frustrated. I honestly have a lot of anxiety um, seeing I could not be part of any of the budget public meetings because I work 45 hours a week in a salon. Um, and I can't, can't do anything virtual because I work in a salon once again. So the rule meetings were very inaccessible for working class people. So I wasn't able to speak on why we cannot increase the DMPD funding because I know personally what it feels like to be attacked by our police force. I have been hit, trigger warning, by, with batons. I have been maced. And after that happened, I wasn't able to work my job for months because I could not leave my apartment. After that happened, I could not drive my car because of the trauma of what happened. Seeing the cops down here is terrifying to me. But I keep showing up and I keep speaking out because I know what it feels like to be beaten down. I know what it feels like to be hurt. I know what it feels like to be silenced and forgotten by my city where I came here to be accepted, to experience things that I have never experienced. And the fact that y'all keep putting DMPD funding on the consent agenda is abysmal. It is disgusting to people of color, to people who come here to try and find comfort, to try and find answers to their issues that they have. It makes me literally see, like, I could not focus on anything in the meeting when I saw okay, we're going to get infrared whatever eyeglasses for the cops so they can respond to crime. That's not answering crime's question. That's just responding to it. So I'm done. Adam Kellanan. Adam Kellanan, he, him, Ward 350309. Um, on accessibility, we need virtual or hybrid meetings now. Many members of the public cannot come to City Hall due to lack of accessibility on many things that's made a lot worse by the lack of the mask ban. Um, 
or sorry, the black the mask ma mandate. Uh, these are not public meetings if not everyone can attend, and right now not everyone can attend. The city has had more than six months to figure out how to provide any kind of virtual option and has not delivered anything um, substantial, even as long as lines of like an update. Uh, it's also questionable that the city is keeping these meetings at COVID capacity after removing all the COVID restrictions like the mask mandate in the building. We had people in this meeting who couldn't talk because they were out in the overflow room. And that's just really odd, especially because I know like on the cameras, if you're just watching this at home, you would just think this is how many people came out to City Hall. And it's not. It was like double the amount of people that were here at the start. Um, it's just really bizarre to me. Um, council should also remove the ban of food and drinks in City Hall. Um, we were here for a long time and we've had no food or drinks. I know council gets like some kind of drinks. I don't know what you get, but I know that rule doesn't apply to everybody in here. Um, and it needs to be dropped if it's not applied to everybody. Um, public trust in DMPD. I keep hearing the city is spending more money to build public trust in DMPD. That concerns me greatly because the public doesn't trust DMPD for very valid reasons that others have spoken already brought up. And if the city wants to build trust, they should address the harm that Des Moines Police Department has done, not just fund expensive PR campaigns to put more money and power into the police to convince people to trust people that don't need to be trusted. We shouldn't ask the public to trust an untrustworthy, racist, sexist, violent department, and we definitely shouldn't spend our money to do so. We need to fire Police Chief Dana Wingert, fire Scott, City Manager Scott Sanders, and defund the Des Moines Police Department. We want a racial profiling ban in part of our demands, and now years later we've not seen major, major progress. We know that more needs to be done, and the city has not seemed to be doing anything or even listening to our comments on all fronts. Thank you. Viola Perry. Our Mayor, Council Members, Viola Perry, CCI Racial Justice Team, um, Ward 1, 50310. As you all know, CCI's community six-point racial profiling ordinance wasn't passed until 2020 after the horrific murder of George Floyd. A few points were addressed, but still it needs to be strengthened. With that said, what else is on the table? Well, we want a community review board that will work for more accountability and transparency. And I'm referring to the Cedar Rapids model. So what's the fear? What's the delay? You speak of hearing from the community, community involvement, get involved, but that's where it stops. You just speak and then you go away. What else do we want? We want a third party investigation of DMPD. When you have that racial profile of black men and women, and then you got one and a half million dollars so far paid out for police misconduct and recent allegation of sexual harassment within the police department. So I say to you, remove your hand off of delay, delay button. Speak to these issues on the April 4th City Council meeting. It's about accountability, and that includes Chief Winger. Speaking of accountability, uh, I believe the Public Works uh, report is to be finalized in May. Yes? 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 Okay, thank you. Well, we, the community, the public, want to know the results of that report. We want the good, the bad, and the ugly. Lori Ann Young. Lori Young, I reside in Ward 1, 50310 is my zip code. I'm a member of Iowa CCI's racial justice team, and here's a little history lesson for you. Council, it took you nearly two years to pass an anti-racial profiling ordinance in June of 2020, but you left quite a bit out that the public asked for. You left out a ban on pretextual stops, which are still happening in the city today. You left out the creation of a community re review board um, there's a great Cedar Rapids model that you need to give strong consideration and discussion about so that people like me and other members of the community don't have to do the community oversight of our own police department. And three, you left out making marijuana a low-level enfor enforcement priority. 
You never even adopted one recommendation that your own marijuana task force suggested. And so here we are four years later, and we have a police department that has cost taxpayers one and a half million dollars in lawsuit settlements for wrongful conduct. Here we are four years later with a police department that has been accused by five of its own female employees of sexual discrimination and ongoing sexual harassment. Here we are four years later with a police department that engages in excessive force. I know you've seen the videos of police violence during the 2020 protests. If not, they're going viral on social media. And right now, there are eight pending lawsuits against the DMPD representing 23 plaintiffs. So get ready to shell out some more taxpayer money to settle these lawsuits. So we're not going to wait another three or four years. We demand that a third party investigation of the Des Moines Police Department. We want a community review board. And because of the toxic and ongoing corrupt culture that is endorsed at the top, Chief Wingert must go. City Council, it's your job. It's your job to make sure that policing is fair and equitable and nonviolent. Yeah. And we expect to see these three items on the next City Council agenda. Thank you. Laurel Clinton. Laurel Clinton, Des Moines, Iowa resident member of CCI Racial Justice Team. And Linda, I'm glad to hear that you're interested in public safety. We all had to go through metal detectors to get up here just to talk to you tonight. So you're all very safe. At least from us. What I want to talk about is what occurs from some people in the public se sector who don't feel safe. So we come here week after, week after week, month after month, to talk about public safety and what it does and how some of us and our families in this community don't feel safe. And so it's your access and your abilities to respond to the public who come here week after week asking for your support and to not just listen to us, but to respond. And we're asking for your response in the form of putting agenda items that we speak on repeatedly, finally on the city council agenda to be addressed by the full council. So we're asking, we are asking that you, the city council, take the responsibility that you're tasked with to ensure all people in Des Moines are safe safe from the Des Moines police that have been caught on video time after time exhibiting deplorable behavior. We need to get rid of those people. They're not part of a safety, um, public safety environment. And you can't decide that kids are more violent than we have seen coming from our own police department. Who do you think these, these are our role models that these kids are watching? So if you want our youth to be responsible, City Council, you have to take on that same level of responsibility for the people that you govern, and that's our police department. So I'm going to ask, along with the rest of my group and the people here, that you address everything we're asking for. Bridget Peterson. Terry Gosnell. Terry Gosnell, uh, Ward 3, she, her, hers. I live in uh, 50312. I want you to imagine this. Imagine walking down the street, minding your own business, and someone from across the street starts hollering at you. You might know who that person is, but maybe you don't know them very well. But them and their little friends, they come over and start taunting you. They start asking a bunch of questions, and like you did something wrong, right? And then they start taunting you, like, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to fight me? And you realize that they're the ones that came prepared for this confrontation. How would you feel when you find yourself in a situation where somebody suddenly feels very brave and you can't fight back? 
Now think about Jared Clinton, right? He was in his friend's car on a nice, it was a nice day outside. You're going for a drive and they get pulled over. The first thing the female officer asks, says is, you look like you have a gun. Can you imagine how afraid he suddenly became at that moment? How many times have we seen on the news how this situation plays out? This was a young man in our city, not some national tragedy. What if it was your son, brother, or friend? For years, you've been dragging your feet about making real transformation. You seem to act like we're lucky that we even get to speak at all. But why? Is this not important? Does it not affect you? For some reason, we use the people's money and trust a small group of people to use their own judgment about deadly force. And the public has no say. How does that make any sense? We need to see these three things on the next agenda. Third party investigation of the MPD, community review board, and fire chief winger. Put yourself in someone else's shoes. If you are being treated like this, how could you accept inaction? Amy Lubert. Amy Lubert, she, her pronouns, Ward 1, 50310. I'm here to echo the voices calling for a third party investigation of the MPD. I'm curious why you wouldn't want that. If they're not doing anything wrong, what's the harm? What are we hiding? Same thing with the community review board. We've been asking for this since 2018. If there's nothing to hide, if you, everything is going great, why? Why can't we have a community review board? What, it, what are you afraid of? I know what you're afraid of. You're afraid of us finding out that Chief Wingert is exactly who he is, who he's been showing us he is, and he should be fired. So we're asking for you to put on the next city council agenda a third party investigation, a community review board, and firing Chief Wingert. And it's time to show some leadership. When you're in leadership, sometimes you have to take in new information and change your mind. And you sometimes look like a dumbass. You know what? That happens when you're in leadership and you actually care about the community that you are representing. And you have been voted in to care about the community. And it is time. We will accept you if you start listening and making changes. This could go a lot easier, y'all. It's time. Next city council, we're here. Tony Gardner. <laughs> Tony Gardner, Ward 3. First and foremost, Mr. Mayor, thank you for voting with us in opposition to the Oaks on Fleur. As a father of two young daughters, raising them in today's society, it is difficult. Teaching them to be strong, independent, and fearless leaders is hard. And keeping them out of the Oaks on Fleur project was difficult, but they see the realities of it. They see the trees being removed and the wildlife being displaced, and they want to know why is daddy going door to door and making so many phone calls, and why is he up so late sending emails? And I, and I say this because, Linda, you and I spoke on phone, and we had a very good conversation. And you said, and I quote, I do not like this project, and I do not like where it is located. If I voted today, I would vote no. However, this is out of my ward. And with respect to Josh, I will vote with him. So with your vote tonight, you have proven to all females that even elected officials can do a man's bidding without even batting an eye. And it's an unfortunate reality. I understand that. And I hope and pray that my daughters never grow up learning to take orders from a man. And you proved it tonight. You took everyone's speech in opposition of the Oaks on Fleurs and said, it's quiet, scenic. It's like it's a different area. They're afraid of the storm runoff into the neighborhood below. And people like this neighborhood. Zero people in the neighborhood supported this. And they have concerns about the trees taking down. But that was in, a, in regards to agenda item 15. Your contradictions are absurd. Now, you have all tried so hard to silence Indira. And unfortunately for you, Linda, all it takes is a man. 
Chris Robinson. My name is Chris Robinson. I'm in Ward 2, 50316 is my zip code. Oh, man, I tell you, tonight's, yeah. What is it about the Des Moines Police Department that uh, they can assault folks and it's okay? Nothing happens. There's been video, I'm pretty sure you folks have seen the video of the Des Moines uh, Police Department during the riots, <clears throat> how they treated certain individuals. Uh, pepper spraying people, pushing people down in the street, leaving them. If you pepper spray them, this will at least supposed to make sure they're okay. You had 15 or so officers walking around. None of them checked to make sure any of these individuals were okay. So I guess we have a city council that is okay with that. You don't think they did anything wrong. That's why they, we have rogue officers that are out here acting the way they act because of look at how y'all act and what y'all allowed to happen. And it's not right. Because best believe, if I would have had a confrontation with an officer, I'm going to jail. If I assault somebody, my black behind is going to jail. Bottom line, there's if, ands, buts about it. If you folks remember, especially, and dear you won't because you weren't on the council at the time, but every single last one of you, the rest of you was. When it came to that federal building being built, what did every one of you on this city? City, the feds was not listening to you guys. Next, next speaker. Next speaker, please. So, Jolene, sit down. I haven't called your name yet. This is just right. This is, this is just what I mean. You don't listen to the people. You're being disruptive, sir. Is all right. Jolene Prescott. I'm Jolene Prescott. I live in Ward 2. Um, I had a chance to use our libraries, and I was able to read a book called The 1619 Project. And I, it really opened my eyes to some things. What I think we really need to do is educate people, educate kids about the realities of slavery, right? We need to get at the heart of racism. So why don't you guys do something about that? Can you, can you have curriculum? They just can, they have, you have, can you change curriculum? No, that, that, that's three quarters of a mile that way. Well, how about voting rights? You know, everybody should be able to be able to vote. It shouldn't be a problem. Can you guys change anything about voting procedures? Uh, no, that's three quarters of a way the east here. Well, how about marijuana? I think we should just legalize marijuana for recreational purposes. Half the people in this state want it. So why don't you guys just legalize marijuana? You can't do that, can you? Because that's the people three quarters of a mile away. Was anybody at the candidates forum last Saturday at Noche? Because we're trying to put on a garbage campfire here when the whole building is on fire there. That's where our problem is. And if you're not doing something about that, then you're really not doing what you need to do. And that's where I started. I started at the candidates forum on Saturday and looked at the candidates for the House because that's where the changes have to come first. Thank you. Abby Banks.
All righty, Abby Banks, she, her, Ward 350312. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to talk fast because I'm fucking hangry. Uh, I sound like a broken record, but we're still in a pandemic, and it's irresponsible and reckless for any institution to lift their mask mandate when there is a direct relationship between rises in cases of COVID and a lack of mandates. This creates an extremely unsafe environment for all community members, but especially immunocompromised folks. The fact that it's been almost two years after getting COVID as a healthy 19-year-old college sophomore, and I still have symptoms every day, and I don't know how that's going to affect me down the line is terrifying, and I don't want to put anyone else in that situation, and you shouldn't either. The lack of basic public health precautions just compounds on the inaccessibility of city council meetings. Aiden, a community member and disability activist who's unable to attend meetings largely due to your lack of accessibility, cites this as a direct violation of, AD, of the ADA, and I would agree. Furthermore, I uplift the calls by community members for accurate closed captions, transcripts, and an end to the premature cutting off of speakers, microphone, and camera. This action makes it impossible for anyone attempting to participate virtually to actually hear what people are saying after the mic has been cut off. It's almost like you're trying to silence and exclude the people you're supposed to represent. And we all know you would never do that. Uh, third, the Des Moines Police Department is a violent and oppressive organization that's abolition is integral to the existence of safe communities for all. They should not be receiving any funding, but especially not on the consent agenda where public comment is prohibited. Tonight, we saw you vote for over $470,000 in additional police funding on top of the exorbitant amount of money they already get. I'm terrified to see how that will be used against my community. Uh, I've been attending city council meetings for two years and nothing has changed. Yeah, we might have Indira up there who actually tries to represent us, but your disregard for basic human rights and complete lack of human decency or compassion remains a strong pillar of white supremacy and violence that will be a horrifying chapter in the history books of Des Moines. Thank you. I Micah McCutcheon. Mike and McCutcheon, Ward 3, 50309. I'm going to kind of talk about something a little bit different, but I just want to say, I echo all of you, um, DMPD should not, not be getting raises in funding or be funded at all, and there should be some accountability happening. But I'm going to talk about Mid American Energy instead for a few minutes here. Um, Mid American Energy is the biggest carbon polluter in our state and has publicly stated they will continue to burn coal until 2049. 2049 is far too late. Our planet and our community cannot wait until I'm 50 years old to give up coal. Um, a just transition from coal is important to me because I care about the world we leave behind for future generations, not only physically, but emotionally. For me, climate change has played a detrimental role in my mental health. Thinking about how preventable it is and how companies like MidAmerican openly continue to choose profit from burning coal makes my feelings of depression and hopelessness even worse, especially when we have the technology and ability to transition to 100% carbon-free energy already. Why would I want to stick around a planet that is imploding, especially when those with the power to prevent it continue to choose profits over people's lives? Can you imagine how the youth feel growing up knowing that things will only get worse if we continue down this path? To protect our minds, our bodies, our children, and our planet, we must start retiring coal plants today to create a future that is not only livable, but joyful to be a part of. Des Moines City Council must refuse to sign a franchise agreement with MidAmerican until they commit to retire their five coal plants in Iowa by 2030 for the good of our health, our city, and our community. Thank you. Courageous fire. <laughs> you guys, I don't want to repeat of the incident we had at the last meeting where we had police in the chamber. So if you guys would please just not engage in these things that escalate conflict. Thank you. I'm courageous fire. My legal substitute zip code is 50304. Because I'm not finished with my uh, absentee ballot stuff, I have no idea what ward I'm in. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because I went through a lot of trouble to try to be safe. I'm a domestic violence survivor. So I use Iowa Safe and Home Address. And with all of the trouble I've gone through, 
as a black woman raising two black girls to try to keep us safe. Now I'm a single mom. <laughs> and at home, I am safe. Because of what I've done through, I was safe at home. The abuser can't just roll up on me because he doesn't know where we live. But as soon as I leave my house, go to the store, drive my car, check out a library book, now I'm worried about what's gonna happen to me and where will my kids go. I've watched over the last two years at least, things continue to de, to just diminish as far as my safety. And as a 53 year old woman, I'm not silly. I knew it was already bad for me, but it's gotten worse. My girls worry when I'm gone, I check in with my 15 and 16 year old kids because they're terrified. What happens if mom doesn't come home? When we're talking about making sure that people are being investigated that need to be by something that is a third party so that we know it's impartial and unbiased, I need that protection. When we're talking about someone being able to have community review boards, I need that protection. Michael Lynn Mantle. Okay. I move to receive and file. I'll second it. Motion to receive and file. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, we've received and filed all communication reports. That's the last item on our agenda. I wanna thank the public for attending this evening. I know it's a rather long evening, but uh, appreciate your input. Have a good evening, meeting's adjourned.